All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speedruns from the Crypt, your bi-weekly horror hotfix. I'm McDysis, and tonight we're going to be bringing you a bunch of spooky games. Although, I guess they're all going to be done in a row. Uh, before we do begin, though, I do want to say that SGDQ 2023 is coming up from May 28th to June 4th in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If you're interested in attending the events, registration is now open until May 3rd. You can go to gamesandquick.com for more information. Alrighty, so I thought it'd be fun to take a dive into the world of Rapture. Uh, Bioshock is a classic horror series, and there is a lot to be had. Uh, even the later title of Bioshock, even it does have fun horror moments and does retain its horror themes. So, honestly, I think I've only ever had one and two on the show, and it's been a while since we've had them. So, I figured it'd be a time to take a dive into Rapture once again. Anyway, uh, we're going to be doing all three runs in a row uh, because our runner tonight, Blood Thunder, does do a category where it's a lot of the anthology based runs. So uh, please join us for the Bioshock trilogy with Blood Thunder. Take it away. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Uh, this is the Bioshock trilogy, which, if, like, what does that exactly mean? That means we're going to be running through Bioshock 1, which you see on screen now. Then right after that, we'll be going into Bioshock 2 and Bioshock Infinite, all any percent uh, categories. So start to finish as fast as we can do them. Uh, there's a little bit of a asterisk on infinite with uh, a mod that we'll talk about once we get there. But yeah, fun horror games. Um, I love showing off all of these and they're all very uh, scary if you play them casually. But in terms of a speed run, we'll see. Anyways, we got some time to talk at the intro of this one. Uh, we're just going to load this one from a save file. Got to scroll back here real quick. We do save a lot throughout these games, so we'll load into the crash light here. Skip those pesky cutscenes. And then we'll start time in three, two, one, go. All right, so we're heading off from our plane wreck. We're just going to take a quick trip through the fire and the flames. We always carry on. Uh, this is a lighthouse. We will see many lighthouses throughout the series. It's the game once said... Always a lighthouse, always a man. Uh, but we are Jack. We just crashed in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, hey, mysterious lighthouse ahead of us. Uh, this lighthouse is going to take us into Rapture where we began our journey. Very, very spooky stuff. Um, the Bioshock series tends to get the, the horror tag on them. Uh, but, you know, they're not necessarily the spookiest once you start getting weapons and plasmids that really trivialize the, the scariest. But we're going to make our way through the dark down and do our first trick, hopefully. A little bit of a I mean, we got to do here. We're going to jump out of the bathysphere as we hit the lever. It's going to cause us to get stuck up on top, so we can't move around. We can't really use this to speed things up or really traverse too far, but we get a nice view on the outside of the bathysphere here. We can kind of see around where we're not supposed to. And then at the end of the map, it's going to let us hit the trigger into the next map a little bit sooner. Um, anyways, we had a nice little trip with Andrew Ryan. <laughs> so normally, you're just looking at a screen. He's going to be talking a whole bunch, but uh, you know, right now, it's just A-OK. -okay. Very, very memorable opening here. This is really the only downtime that we have in Bioshock 1. Bioshock 2 has a little bit of stuff here and there. It's gotten a lot more optimized recently. Uh, I did showcase this run at HDQ uh, just a couple months ago. And if you saw that run, and you'll see here in just a little bit, there's a very big, important trick known as splicer surfing. Uh, and that also applies to Bioshock 2, which I'll be showcasing at HDDQ coming up in just a couple months. So get a little bit of a refresh on the things we just did and a little sneak peek at things to come. So yeah. Raptor's still being built over here. Fortunately, I don't think those buildings are going to make it. Get a little handsome squared root over here on this statue. Just kind of setting the stage for us here. Introducing us to the fact that we're in a city under the water. We get a little glimpse of a big daddy up here. Some animals. That fun kind of thing that you like in horror games. My favorite part about the animals here is that, like, they just freeze when they go off camera, supposedly. Like, when you're supposed to, like, be yeah. looking in the bat sphere, it's like, oh, hey, they're moving, and then you just look at them, and they're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. 
Yeah, like moving cinematics like this, or even just like enemies spawning and despawning throughout games, is a very interesting mechanic to study because not only do developers try to keep you immersed, but they'd like spawn in all of these things, and then once they're spawned in, put them in front of you, so it's not like snapping in front or just despawning. Uh, just something you don't tend to think about. It's like, oh, this enemy just jumped on screen, but before he jumped on screen, how did he get to be in the game? Speaking of an enemy disappearing, here's Johnny. Not the brightest. We're doing a lot with uh, <laughs> spawning and despawning some enemies once we actually get a little bit of control. you also notice I'm now inside the bathosphere, which uh, the game has generously put me into. First glimpse at a splicer. Although spider splicers like this don't show up again in the game for some time. It is very important to note that there are different types of splicers and that does matter for the run. So this is a spider. They like jump around and climb on walls and stuff like that. Uh, the ones that we are mainly going to be dealing with throughout Bioshock 1 are the thuggish splicers. The ones that have melee weapons, pipes, wrenches, stuff like that. There's also uh, lead heads which have guns. There are Nitro Splicers, which have, like, grenades. Houdini Splicers that, like, teleport in and out. And then uh, Bioshock 2 has some additional ones, like the Brute. But we're going to meet Atlas. He's going to be our handy-dandy guide throughout Rapture. Going to lead us through our uh, starting adventure. We're not really going to, you know, take his word at all, although he does ask pretty nicely. Uh, it's not something we're going to have time to pay attention to, but hey, we have full control, and we can start breaking the game. However, first we still need to grab a weapon. These so weapons are very cool. So right over here is our handy dandy wrench. Play Bioshock 1, you probably know this wrench. It is very, very powerful. Wait for the spawn in, and there we go. Okay. First little trick we're gonna do is jump over this couch, manipulate the splicer to run in towards us, grab stuff, and then what's known as electrical cutscene skip is a little bit of a tricky thing to explain, but we're going to save. And while we're saving, we're gonna hit use and then escape to bring up the menu. So allows me to pick up Electrobolt and also make a save. Once you pick up Electrobolt, you go into a cutscene. Um, and you're not supposed to be able to save and load once you're in that cutscene. Uh, but if you save and load, you can jump away. Uh, so you can see the game's trying to pull me back to that cutscene. It's very important to note. So the only way to escape that is to jump. Uh, if we try to walk, it's just going to drag us back. That's not possible. So we're just going to have to hop our way through the rest of the map. Uh, it's also the reason we have the black bars on the top and bottom of the screen. That means that the cutscene is playing out or attempting to play out, I should say. Uh, it is also very easy to lose control when you're just jumping around like this. Uh, stuff on the floor can really just make your life a living hell. If you happen to hit the wrong thing. Ultimately, if you're super well practiced and you've done a lot of runs, the jumping is not that much slower than just walking normally. However, it can be a real pain to learn initially. Uh, a lot of times people would ask, you know, does this even save time? Because you're having to do this jump and it seems really like a time loss. Uh, as you can see, the black bars are still on my screen. So the cutscene's still playing, or it would still be playing like this far. And it's going to allow us to skip another cutscene here in a little bit. So yes, it saves a very vast amount of time um, for a little bit of a headache. And draw a little pretty picture, maybe a little smiley face. Eh. Looks a little angry. So we're gonna grab our second weapon here, a pistol, also a very useful. It's a very problematic little hallway to jump down. Once we get into the bathroom, we're pretty much set. So the black bar is the only way the cutscenes end it, which is very important, because we don't want to be in the cutscene when we jump in here. So we're going to get stuck to this wall, and the only way to break free is to do another save-load combo. I'll do what I 
uh, which allows us to jump once again. Uh, go into this cutscene, which is where the Big Daddy kind of gets introduced. You see him a little bit before in the last one, but this is where he makes his big debut. Uh, anyways, we can pull our weapons back out, which we're not supposed to have here, and to just hop past it all. And we're almost through Welcome to Rapture, but we have a little bit of a fight to go. Just gonna take out some splicers. Start the fight. So not only do we get dragged back towards that cutscene start, uh, it also kind of affects the mouse. You get like a little bit of a stick drift, even if you're playing with mouse and key. So we're going to try to get stuck against this corner, so it's a little bit easier. And then we're going to have to shoot two splicers. So my hand's not on my mouse, not on my keyboard, but you can see the mouse is still turning, which makes getting headshots a little bit tricky. Uh, the Pistol at this point is a one shot to the head, two shot to the body, so you don't really have to be super precise. Uh, it's faster to get headshots. And then a lovely trick that was pointed out by a developer who found it in development and they just left it in. Uh, but this door and only this door in the game, you can shock with Electro Bolt and it'll also load the next map. No other door will do that. Uh, but it's pretty cool they left it in. So let's just get past another like 30 second cutscene. And now we're on to medical. One of the hardest maps to do, especially nowadays. <laughs> Gonna introduce us a few mechanics here. First we need to get this cash register set up. So where props become a real nuisance. <laughs> There's not a real good way to move things without telekinesis. There's a plasma that we're going to try to get here. I'm going to save just because the splicer is very important to us and we don't want to lose her. Um, but there's actually two splicers over here and we only want to draw the first. We're going to look at the floor, aggro the splicer and get her to chase us. Damage her once. That way when we hit her one more time she's going to die. And this is very important as I'll explain here in a little bit. <laughs> it's much easier to explain the second time around and not on the first. All right, Splicer, you got to come over here. Okay, save here. It's very important uh, that the Splicer does not die until we want her to die. And she's in the right position. Okay, one more save. So we're going to be saving a whole bunch just because these tricks are... Uh, Pretty particular in what you have to do. You may have seen a glimpse of what we're trying to do. All right, so when you kill a splicer, you kind of become part of their body uh, and you lose your own hitbox, which means that you can clip through walls and floors and doors and ceilings and whatever you want, really, uh, as long as it's thin enough. But when that splicer is spinning around and they die, you kind of get like clipped into the wall and you can skip right to where telekinesis is. It's a very broken uh, plasmid, especially in combination with what we just did. Uh, and this allows us to skip incinerate entirely. Um, so we have to go get incinerate so you can get telekinesis. Um, and in death, we're back here. But nowadays, we don't do that. We're just going to keep the electro bolt and... Alkinese plasmids for the rest of the game. Gonna get another splicer. So you have to be able to walk on top of the splicer's head for this to work. You can't jump or fall onto it. Uh, you'll just start bouncing off. But uh, now that we're on her body and we have telekinesis, we can use this to fly around and just kind of clip through whatever we want. So. That's what we'll be doing for the rest of Bioshock 1, and uh, it does also apply into Bioshock 2. It is a lot harder to pull off there for reasons we'll get into once we actually get the Bioshock 2, but it's a very fun, silly trick that uh, I love doing. So let's go do it some more, shall we? This is Neptune's bounty. This is where you would normally go and get the camera. I'm uh, going to save again. 
and you get to go take a whole bunch of pictures of spider splicers, learn about the like camera mechanic that's used to unlock uh, bonuses, onyx, stuff like that, um, or combat. If you only get one shot at the splicer being alive and then dying, it is very important. I said before that uh, they're in the right spot, and that's why we have to save it so much. It's also very easy to fall out of this state. If you bump into any sort of collision, so their gun, their hat, if they're wearing one, um, anything like that will just get you stuck, uh, which is rather annoying, but... Uh, Neptune's is probably the hardest level in Bioshock 1 to do because of it. A lot of stuff we got to do here. Uh, and half of it is because we skip incinerate. If you do uh, an easier version of medical and getting uh, incinerate still, which is only like 30 seconds slower or something, uh, you don't have to do the crazy strat here, but... So we went hard on medical, we have to go hard on Neptune. So we're gonna clip through at this grate. And normally like splicer bodies aren't supposed to come with you through whatever you're clipping into, but uh, this grate is a little bit different. bit of a, an issue there. Let's go ahead and save again. It's never a bad thing to save when you're doing these. Uh, but we have to give up our weapons. That way the, this door opens. We could just clip through this, but then we can't really do the rest of the trick. Which is very, very important for us. Like I said before, we don't have incinerate. So, to melt the ice coming up, which is normally uh, you know, what you use incinerate for, there are a couple different ways you can go about it. The way we're going to do it is we're going to light the body on fire using a handy dandy barrel. Bring the body with us, get our weapons back real quick. The body only lasts uh, so long on fire before it goes out. So we need to melt that ice and then we need to melt the ice over here. Grab our grenade launcher damage increase, which is going to be very helpful later on, once we actually start using grenades for combat. And we're through Neptunes. It's a little bit rough, but uh, that being the hardest level, we'll absolutely take that. Uh, Smuggler is a very easy level in comparison to what we've already done. It's pretty much just a little uh, walking sim with a very short uh, skip that we get to do. But it introduces a very interesting mechanic uh, known as diary skipping, or just audio skipping. Um, basically, there's two types of audio in the game. There's these radio messages that keep popping up and playing out that are like marked as important dialogue that's going to advance the story uh, that the game wants to play out at all costs. So if you're trying to leave a level and there's a radio message playing, it's going to let that finish before it takes you to the next level. Uh, we're just going to save, hit use, and then hold back so I can get past this. Um, and that skips getting locked in that room. Uh, and then as far as the other type of message goes, they're known as diaries, the ones you kind of find around the levels, which are optional. The game doesn't really care about it. It's like, oh, you can play those at any time. Uh, if that's playing, go ahead and do whatever you want. Uh, so we can use diary messages to skip radio messages that are playing. So we're going to get over here. Be quite a few queued up because we just skipped a big cutscene. Uh, we're gonna open up the menu and then play one of the diaries we've picked up along the way. And the game's like, oh, that's optional. Go ahead and leave. So anytime we get to the end of the level, which is usually pretty fast, and we just have a whole bunch of radios queued up, we just play a simple diary and just go on ahead. Now we get to go through Arcadia, which introduces us to flings. Uh, flings are the other broken trick that we get to do. 
alongside Spl uh, Splicer Surfing. Splicer Surfing kind of replaced Flings in a lot of instances. Uh, so it's what we just did right there. Instead of using a dead body, we can use objects with high FPS and telekinesis to fling up into the air, boost up into the air. Um, and get over walls, we can get over triggers, which we're going to hear in a second. And, uh, they're also pretty fun. want to make sure no one's following us, we don't want enemies around us when we're doing this. Okay. So the end of Arcadia, there is a trigger that starts the Lazarus Vector quest line, which kills off the trees and forces you to Farmer's Market. However, we can just hop over the trigger... And get through the door before it locks. It's also look based, so if you hear that noise, that big like grating metal sound, means the door is locking um, and the quest is started, but we are past all that. Farmer's Market is where you get the bees. You guys remember those from playing, you're like, I don't remember exactly what Farmer's Market is, but uh, if you remember the bees, that's what we just skipped over. Big long fight as well. And here's Ford Frolic, a level that is pretty much like the unanimous level everyone loves, everyone's favorite. Uh, unfortunately, it's also like the shortest map in the game. This game loves to show you the exit to a level and then says, hey, here's the exit, but to go through this exit, you need to go do something else first. However, while the Bath Sphere disappears, it's hard coded to have the lever there in its place. So if you know where to look and can get to it, you can just pull the lever and leave. So, <laughs> there goes Fort Frolic. Everyone's favorite level. Uh, now, this is where we go back to the beginning. Uh, the types of splicers really, really matter. We're going to set up another splicer surf, but we need to be able to walk on a splicer's head. And the only one that's going to get close enough to really allow that to happen is this thuggish that has the pipe. It's also got a hat that I'm going to remove, so that's collision. Sometimes they do like a ru <laughs> to run away. I'll let them run for a little bit. I'm not really sure exactly why this happens, but every now and then they just like to run away. So it's going to take them through the level. Um, it's also kind of theorized that if you walk backwards, it helps them stay with you, so we're just going to try to walk through this level backwards real quick. It's something that I always hate to admit that I've gotten good at, like... I've just gotten so used to playing this level, I can just do it backwards. Oh, nope, running away? Not too far. Alright, this lead head doesn't matter. This is also like the only thuggish available to us, so we have to bring them really, really far. Where did he go? Oh, what? <laughs> Pulled a magic trick, okay. I didn't know he was a Houdini splicer too. Come on, buddy. This way. Oops. Almost through the spot. All right, right here. Gonna come attack us. And uh, once again, this level's like, hey, here's the exit. Go build a bomb and then come back. Uh, but we don't got time for that, so. It's gonna line them up. This so wall's a little bit tricky because there's a lot of void just to the side there. And this is going to get us into the Rapture Central Control. This is also another very memorable part of the game. This is where you meet Andrew Ryan. And the Would You Kindly cutscene plays out. Uh, but we're going to do some audio shenanigans here. We're actually going to do the inverse of what we did before. So we want to keep this level transition loaded. Uh, we don't want to go back to Hephaestus right now, but we want to start that process. So I played a radio message that the game's like, okay, you need to listen to this. Let's not transition just yet. I can get some stuff done first. Uh, but we also need to open this door, which is locked behind other radio messages. So we're going to have to skip radio messages using other messages. A little bit confusing. Uh, and then we're going to get up into Andrew Ryan's cutscene. I'm going to play one of those diaries so we can start transitioning back to Hephaestus and then start the cutscene. 
this is going to allow us to skip the first half. There are two parts to Andrew Ryan's cutscene. Uh, and kind of like when we go back to the Electric Bolt cutscene earlier, where you're not supposed to be able to save and load, this will allow us to do a save load once we get back to Andrew Ryan. So we are going to go back for the second part. Um, and then we can get past that just as easily. With a little bit of a pain. Um, it's easy, but it's, it's tricky. Because to get back into the cutscene, which is easy to skip, uh, there is a gate that we have to now fling over. So we can grab, uh, grab this handy dandy napalm. One of the trickier flings to do, because the ceiling here is actually pretty low. So if your PC is too good and your frame rate's too high, you're just going to hit the ceiling a whole bunch. So we'll see what happens. first try. Okay. So once we go into the part two, we can just do a nice easy save load. It's going to give us our movement back. Andrew Ryan's going to keep on going. Going to have some fun over there by himself. And we can start the override here. Familiar phrase. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly it's the big pivotal plot twist of the game. We find out that uh, Atlas, our handy dandy guy that's been helping us through Rapture, uh, telling us how to splice or surf and everything, obviously, uh, that he is actually the bad guy. Whoa. Didn't see that coming. Uh, some more dire skips to get past it. Andrew Ryan's still doing his, his stuff. He will actually go through the whole thing. It's pretty fun to watch in third person, but uh, sadly, we don't have time for it. So now we're into like the back third of the game. Where things kind of, from a story perspective, kind of dip, dip down. Um, but we have a lot of fun tricks still ahead of us. Olympus Heights and Apollo Square are kind of like two levels. Um, it's, it's like one level split into two. There's one dose of Lot 192, which we're going to use to break the mind control that uh, Fontaine has on us. Which is Atlas. Um, we're not actually going to get the two doses. We're going to skip past them. There's one dose here and one in a, uh, an Apollo. First, we need to get the little sisters. Some more diary skips. Grab some supplies for the road. We're really just waiting for this little sister. As far as speedruns go for this game, Little Sisters are kind of the bane of our existence. Uh, we have to wait for it here. It's a little slow. And then the uh, dreaded escort mission. She's a little bit of a pain as well. Nowadays, not so much. We've kind of got around half of it. But just got to wait for her to open this door. Sadly, we don't have like telekinesis. Or our weapons to like really do anything here. We just have to kind of wait. Also, be sure to press your unbound key to equip your plasmids. Very important stuff. Okay. So just still kind of unraveling the whole mystery of Fontaine and how he uh, has put Jack in the situation to take over Rapture for him. Uh, once again, stuff we don't really have time for. So we're just going to make our way to the exit of Apollo. We're going to just not care about the dose of Lot, lot 192. Did I just get past this one? Did I just get past this message as well? Now we need to make our way to the end of Apollo. Which is a little bit harder than getting to the end of Olympus. We can't just run to the end because there's like this invisible blocking wind force. That the, like, it's supposed to act as the mind control saying, hey, you can't go down these elevators to the end of the level. Uh, so we have to go find ourselves a handy dandy splicer. And that splicer is the key to leaving this level. This is one of the more uh, interesting splicer surfs. At least until we get into the Font uh, Fontaine Futuristics and Bioshock 2. We need the splicer to come over to this level. Station. 
right there is a perfect example of me not actually walking straight on top of the splicer's head. You can see I was bouncing a little bit. I mean, the height wasn't just right. They can also just destroy this first aid machine, which is just awful. Okay. So the reason this Splicer Surf is a little bit more interesting than the others. Oh, he's getting me stuck in this thing. This is an interesting Splicer. Okay. So we're actually going to take this body out of bounds. And out of bounds, there exists what's known as no player zones, where we as players are not supposed to be. Uh, and cannot enter. So we're going to throw this body through the no player zone. Even though we're still attached to it, it's going to look like we separate. Um, and once it pops out the other side of the no player zone, we will then teleport back to it. So every time it like disconnects me, I'm still on the body. We're just going through one of those zones. So let's use this body to fly into the end, slip seamlessly back in the end of the map. And we're going to take a little bit of extra damage because we're going to do a death warp, meaning we're going to intentionally die. Start a point Prometheus. Just so we can leave the bathosphere a little bit sooner than we're supposed to. This is one reason we get the grenade launcher damage increase earlier on. It uh, gives us more damage to ourselves, actually. Uh, and the others for Fontaine coming up. And do a little... Oop. Okay. Items can be a little bit tricky with flings, depending on how they're set up. Uh... One very important thing about flings in this, and just props in general, if you save when an object's in motion, it will lose collision uh, forever. Even if you do a quick load, a hard load, whatever. Um, once a prop's lost collision, the only way to get it back is to like, leave the level. So you have to be really, really careful when you're making those type of saves. Uh, anyways, we passed a little trigger with this guy waiting around. We're going to do what's known as Last Chance Kid. Where Fontaine just gives us one chance to get through this door. And he's going to T-pose a little... Real nice guy. Even if you mess it up, he still gives you another chance. Your last chance. And we're on to the escort mission. Everyone's favorite. Luckily, we don't have to do all of it the casual intended way. walk up here and passing through this doorway spawns in a splicer behind us uh, which also happens to be a thuggish splicer which is very nice for us Oop, if I can hit her that way we can drag her to the corner I'm gonna grab her mask off real fast once again that is collision that we can hit and get bumped out of this we're going to use this to get past the first little sister door. So these doors only open for the little sisters. Um, okay. So this is what... As I was just mentioning about the items losing their collision, the ashtray loves to lose its collision for, like, no reason at all. Um, it's also very annoying to stack here. We need to walk on top of this splicer's head, which this is not... A thuggish splicer. This is a lead head. So it's not going to come in melee range. Um, but the reason he's not aggressive and will let us do this uh, is because in Point Prometheus, you're supposed to grab the Big Daddy suit. That's the quest line there. Uh, so splicers here don't get aggressive towards you until you actually attack them. Unless you're doing the body harvests. So this guy's like, oh, it's a Big Daddy. I'm not going to mess with that because I don't want to die. Um... So until we actually shoot him, he just doesn't care, and he'll just walk back and forth forever. We're now going to use his body to get down to this door. So we still need a little sister for uh, the rest of this map. 
And for the most part, you can't go to one of these air vents. You can see there's a red right there to get another little sister. Those are only supposed to unlock if she's past a certain checkpoint. Saying you've gotten this far, um, you can now get one out. But for whatever reason, this air vent will let us pull out a little sister, even though we haven't gotten here. So we got to skip the first two of the three body harvest. We're going to take her through to the end. So now we're going to do a little bit of actual combat in the run. It's not something you see too often, especially these days. Um, but it turns out Telkinesis is just completely overpowered for combat as well. So we're going to be using that a lot here. We're also going to be actually pulling out the grenade launcher and using proxy mines for a lot of this. Just going to take care of these splicers real quick. One important note about the little sister is that she does have to hit these certain checkpoints on the floor, so every now and then she'll like kind of stop in place and then run. Uh, that's her hitting these checkpoints. And if you're considered in combat for more than like a second, she'll start running towards you. And even if she passes over these checkpoints she's hitting on the floor, uh, they won't count. So you can't like trigger her to run towards you and then just book it to the end of the map. Um, unfortunately. But during this harvest, she's going to get the atom from here, and we're going to have to protect her. We're going to place up some proxy mines on the way that splicers tend to spawn. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take care of some extra splicers that spawn after the fight. Just as we can. You do have to be a little careful with where you place um, these proxy mines because you can soft lock this if the splicers don't spawn in, uh, which is something we were kind of talking about earlier. But you know, how enemies spawn into the game is a very interesting thing that you don't think about most of the time when you're playing. But uh, like the splicers typically come from the left or right side, and if you just look towards this direction, they'll typically spawn on the right and vice versa. Uh, so she just hit a checkpoint there. I'm going to let her run to the next checkpoint because once she hits that, she's just good for the rest of the level. She doesn't care about us being in combat anymore. Um, so if you put like a proxy mine too close to where the splicers actually spawn into the map, sometimes they just don't spawn. Or they just die too quickly for the game to really count it. And then you're just soft locked waiting for her to harvest. So... Uh, through this, we just have to wait for her to run. We could clip through this door. That is something we could do with Splicer Surfing. However, she has a tool on her. The Atom Harvesting tool that we actually need. Uh, the level won't let us leave until we have that tool. Uh, like We could even clip into this if we really wanted to somehow. Uh, but I have to get the handy dandy tool here. And that's the only reason we need the little sister. But now we can do a fight Fontaine with this. Um, and as soon as we beat up Fontaine, that is where time ends and we'll just... Time for Bioshock 1 ends, I should say. We'll be just heading in the two. Usually when I showcase runs, I like to, you know, let the, the outro play out and whatnot. It's nice to watch, but these multi-game runs, we tend to just get past those. Just head on to the next. So we have another, like, uh, three-ish hours of, of gaming to do, so... The faster we can get one started, the faster we can end it. Fontaine is an interesting boss fight in that he's at, he has like three waves that are supposed to change and you're supposed to adapt your strategy, kind of match um, like what element he's gone to. However, grenades just trivialize the entire thing because he's like red for like fire and heat. Um, and when we stab him again, It'll change colors. And now he's like ice. Uh, I always love when he doesn't set off the proxy mines. Two wave of the proxy mines kill him. And then, because uh, we can only carry six proxies, we just do this last part with frag grenades. This will reload. Alright, and we give him the good old stabbing. And that is 
uh, while it doesn't seem like the end, uh, it just goes into the cutscene there, so that's where Bioshock 1 come to a close. We can head into Bioshock 2. That's it. Goes through on game capturing. This is another one that we start from a save file. Bioshock Infinite, we won't. Uh, that'll actually just go through the whole opening. Uh, but one and two have these little handy dandy starts. Bioshock 2 actually can skip the cutscene. Um, there's like a little bit of a waking up animation that we don't necessarily want to sit through each and every run. Hey! Now we're in Bioshock 2, which is going to look, for some parts, very similar in nature. Uh, and it's going to look very different on other parts. So we already have a handy-dandy melee weapon. We trade out the wrench for a drill. Um, and we're already going to be getting our Electra Bolt up here. Uh, we can do another diary skip. It's a little bit different, which we'll talk about. We have plenty of time to do that uh, to get past the Eleanor stuff. So, uh, while we're still in Rapture itself, the story is very diverted from Bioshock 1. Um, this takes place over um, Subject Delta, who has a little sister named Eleanor, which is not her, you know, they're not biologically related. It's just they're tied together through the process of being a little sister and big daddy. But her real mom, her biological mom, Sophia Lamb takes her away during the opening cutscene, and we're really on a revenge quest to get her back. Uh, Bioshock 1's story and Bioshock Infinite's story are, like, highly uh, revered. And Bioshock 2, on the other hand, is just a very simple revenge story, and that's, that's it. There's no crazy twist, nothing super exciting about it, but, you know, it's just solid. Bioshock 2 is more about the actual gameplay. And one big change is we don't have to swap between our weapons, guns, and wrench and our plasmids. We can have both out at once. So our left hand is going to be controlling our plasmids. Right hand is our weapons. Which doesn't really change much for the speedrun itself. It's just kind of a nice quality of life change. We'll have plenty more. Uh, let's talk once we actually get telekinesis again. This is going to introduce us to the big sister, a, a new enemy to the franchise. They're like big daddies, but have more mobility. You can kind of just jump around the place. This is a forced fight and uh, that we cannot die and the big sister cannot die. So there's really no point in fighting. It's just on a timer. Um, but one thing we want to do is have this big sister shoot fire at this door. So it's going to remain on fire. We can just take some damage. So while we can't die, uh, the timer is checking once it goes off to see if we've been damaged enough or if the big sister's been damaged. Like, oh, you've actually done the fight. We're just going to lower our health. Once again, we can't die. So she's going to shoot us all day. It's not going to matter. And we are simply waiting for the timer to run out. Just marked by that screech. She's going to break open the door and uh, run away. Bioshock 2, because you are a big daddy and you're not just a super mutant baby. You, you get a little glimpse of the actual underwater part of Rapture. They don't go crazy with it, unfortunately. It'd be really cool if there were more involved scenes in the water, but you know, we get a little bit of glimpse. Even the ocean cannot harm you. This is good. But Rapture is the death of many great men. Alone, you will not last long. You can still reach the train station. Find me there. For the most part, anytime you're in these water sections looking at jellyfish and sharks, it is really just a way to get you from one area to the next. Uh, Minerva's Den has a little bit of gameplay outside of the bathos or outside the areas. But even then, it's not uh, anything too crazy. Just a nice casual walk. Maybe in the upcoming Bioshock game. Look at uh, some underwater segments if they go underwater again. 
curious to see what Cloud Chamber has cooking. Every now and then you get a little glimpse of the big sister just kind of watching you from afar, keeping tabs on you, being a little, being a little scary. Uh, anyways, we're going to be doing our first diary skip for this game, which is a lot more tricky than in the first. Uh, there's different ways to do diary skips in this. We're going to do um, a trick here at the beginning of the level. That's a frame perfect trick that we're going to make a save for. That if uh, when we get it, which I got it first try, nice. Uh, that's going to skip all of the diaries or all of the radio messages for the remainder of the stage. There are certain ones that'll still play out because they're hard coded in. But from now on, you're going to see the message in the bottom right pop up and then go away. And we'll do that a couple times throughout uh, Bioshock 2. Mainly at the beginning, because once we get later into the stages, we actually don't really care about uh, radio messages at all, because the splicer surfing. But it's kind of the early games where there's a lot of dialogue, a lot of exposition holding us back. We're going to do these all-encompassing diary skips. Um, and the way they work is the diary that we picked up, it has the same sort of mechanics, radio messages and diaries. If you play a diary you've picked up on the exact frame that a radio message is going to start, then it just bugs out for the remaining of the stage. It's so like these are hard-coded and we got to let these play out because they're part of like a cinematic sort of event. There is another way that you can skip individual messages by just doing a save, load, and then playing a diary that can overwrite them, which we'll see a little bit later on. There's like a, a handful of instances where that's useful. So once we're in this little level, it's going to drop us down into water and turn us. So if we stay like right here at the wall, um, we're going to drop down and then like turn 90 degrees just through the end game animations, little optimizations, saving those sweet, sweet frames. And we don't have to like worry about our health through a lot of these parts. So when you get dropped in the water uh, here or in like the last level, it heals us all the way back up. You hear that little ting. It's health and Eve getting refilled. So it's like, oh, you know, we put you in the spot where we're going to make you take damage. Let us heal you back up. And coming up, we're going to be getting our hands on telekinesis, which is really, really nice for getting uh, splicer surfing. Unfortunately, it's not really useful early game. Uh, Atlantic Express, the map that we're in, it's a very vertical level. And it's not uh, one we can really do a splicer surf to get to the top of the map. And then Ryan's Amusement, which we'll talk about once we get in there, is very, very locked down in terms of skips. Uh, once we get past these, then we can really open up the game. We're going to grab our handy dandy telekinesis. And we can start picking that stuff up. Telekinesis has also got a huge nerf between games 1 and 2 in terms of combat specifically. Uh, we do have to do a little bit more combat in this game than Bioshock 1. So it is unfortunate to lose such a valuable tool, but we have other means of doing damage. Uh, but yeah, when you throw an item, it doesn't do as much damage anymore. It's uh, honestly probably a, a, a good nerf that they did. There really weren't speedruns of Bioshock 1 and uh, done before Bioshock 2 came out. So it's not like a nerf directed at speedrunning itself. Something they realized, oh yeah, we made telekinesis extremely broken in game one. Let's, you know, let's fix that. Uh, so this is a part where you go up this elevator. This is the vertical part of the level. You're supposed to get a lot of exposition kind of telling you about the story and Delta's quest, all the things you got to do about Sophia Lamb. But because we skip all of that, we just get this nice 
little elevator ride. There is a really, really finicky trick here you can do by grabbing an item and uh, hitting it on your head, like dropping it on your head to push yourself forward and then doing a death warp. It saves like two seconds at most, um, and it is really hard to see in this elevator, so it's just like not really a thing worth going for, uh, especially when we have such hard tricks that we have to get through. Um, that no one's really cracked the code on. Bioshock 1, when we're doing splicer surfing, uh, is a lot easier, a lot smoother than uh, what we have to deal with in 2. It's actually like training weights going from this game back to 1. Uh, if you ever want to get really good at splicer surfing in Bioshock 1, learn 2 first. You'll just instantly become much better. It's actually pretty crazy, but... We got a, we got a little bit before I get there. We're gonna get introduced to Tenenbaum. It was a familiar face from Bioshock 1. Uh, when we wake up in Olympus Heights, we're inside Tenenbaum's little safe house with the little sisters. And there's a, a cutscene in Medical and throughout the game dealing with Tenenbaum. If you're wondering why the game looks very low quality, it's probably the most asked question when I do runs of this game. Uh, if we play this game on medium or high graphics, it crashes consistently. Uh, Certain spots will crash like 100% of the time. There's something with the textures that... I don't know if it's loading in a bugged file or something like that, but if we play on low, the game doesn't crash. Or at least it doesn't crash often at all. Um, so that's why the game looks a little worse. We actually don't need high FPS game uh, in this. Like Bioshock 1 and Infinite do need pretty high FPS, but... Uh, two can be done at 60. 60 frames. It just looks really awful because of that uh, that crashing issue, which is unfortunate. Because the game does hold up pretty well on high graphics. Also, as far as Bioshock 1 and 2 go, these are the original releases on PC, not the remastered editions. Some of the tricks carry over the splicer surfing. At least for one carries over. I don't know about two. I would assume so. Uh, but like the diary stuff doesn't work the same, and the flings from one do not work the same. We have another diary skip coming up here. As soon as I get my weapons back here, we're going to do a save. Okay, so that was a little too early. Actually, I need to... Station his. Yeah, because this is a frame perfect thing where I have to time playing the dire message on the same frame that Sinclair is starting his message. That's why I make the save. It does a little bit of an odd timing. Kind of have to adjust it based on. Let's go a little too early. Okay, there we go. A little bit more uh, attempts than I would necessarily like, but we got the first one first try, so I really can't complain. So this is uh, Ryan's Amusement, the worst amusement park in the entire world. It's got one ride, and it's basically modeled after. It's a small world, so it's not really a fun place to be. Um, as far as the speedrun goes, it is so locked down, it's not even crazy. So the rest of the game kind of just lets you do whatever you want. If you can get somewhere and activate a lever, it works. Uh, that is not the case here. Everything is locked behind doing the previous objective. So to leave the level, we need to melt the ice with incinerate. And even though there are other means to melt the ice after buying incinerate, uh, those methods don't work until you actually buy incinerate so we have to buy that and to buy incinerate we have to do the other body harvest uh with the little sister and to get the little sister we have to beat up the big daddy and to get the big daddy we have to get the ticket uh and it's this whole roundabout stuff like if this level worked the ways the other levels do we'd be done in like 30 seconds a minute tops 
Uh, but we get Sports Boost here. It's a plasmid that, or a tonic that lets you move faster. Pretty handy. We just get it for free. Just gonna move a little bit quicker. So do a small diary skip there by playing a message over top of Eleanor. So we can just pick that up a little bit faster. Now we need to take care of this big daddy because he has a, a little sister that we want. I'm going to keep drawing him back towards the door. I really just want him to charge at us. Ideally, we just hit him with Electro Bolt and the drill. Uh, every now and then, doesn't like the charge. Rise Amusement's kind of just a tutorial for how this mechanic works for the remainder of the game. Um, having the little sister and doing Harvest. So, like Bioshock 1, there's a lot of big big daddies and little sisters to interact with. Um, because you are a big daddy in this game. Uh, instead of going around and killing big daddies and just take their little sisters. You can kill big daddies, take their little sisters, and then force them to be your little sister. Just super messed up, but uh, now she's going to gather Adam for us. A baby. And while she's doing that, kind of like the escort mission at the end of Bioshock 1, there's going to be some splicers that attack. Sometimes they don't attack this hide. We don't actually want to kill these splicers. We just want to hit them with Electro Bolt, so they're stunned. Uh, and this is going to like leave them loaded into the level. So when we go to do the second harvest, if everything goes right, they don't just die off on their own. Uh, this means we won't actually have any splicers for that part at all. So we're just going to keep shocking these. They're going to run away, come back. On that bar on the left that's filling up slowly, that's the timer for this harvest. Once that's done, we can pick her up and go. So even though we can get to the second body, um, by going like through a wall and everything. We can't actually interact with that until we harvest this one. Just gonna leave all these guys alive, run through the journey to the surface. This is the one ride. Ryan's amusement. Super fun. Second body. We'll see if any splicers show up. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they just like manage to die on their own. Um, but it will. Sounds like we're okay. Gonna gather some resources while she's gathering some resources. Yeah, it seems like we're okay. We can take this time, we got a nice view of Rapture, in case you ever want to see what it looks like. Look at that view, man. Oof. Beautiful. Alright, we're going to intentionally take some damage here. We're going to fail this hack, which is going to give us uh, damage off. Uh, if you fail a hack, it won't ever kill you, so you can get down to 1 HP and keep failing, and it's, uh, we'll just keep you there. Which is really nice, because we're going to do a death warp here in just a little bit. To tidy up the place a little bit. And we'll be nice, respectful guest at the park. Oh, maybe not. Well, it's close enough, right? Maybe they want to use that sometime soon. So now that she's just about done, we need to pick her up and we need to take her to an air vent. Unfortunately, there's only one because it is a tutorial level. Doesn't want us to have any fun. Uh, so now I have to go track down that air vent and deal with her. Uh, you know, if we take some damage between here and there, that's fine. We just don't want to die. We don't want to be as close to death as possible, though. So while we're taking this barrel. Um, so once we deal with the little sister, we're going to death warp back to the beginning of the map. And they blew up my barrel. That's fine. And there is another barrel. Grab this one. We have backups on backups. Okay. You can still see the radio messages in the bottom right popping up and going away. 
Now, this is going to be a very controversial part for a lot of people. Uh, unfortunately, because we do need a bunch of Adam, we do have to harvest the little sister. You might be thinking, well, if you save enough little sisters over time, it does come out to be more Adam. Uh, this is the only little sister that we're going to interact with in the run. Uh, so we just never have a chance to get to that point. Uh, now we can do our death warp. Dying in this corner is very specific uh, for this death warp because it does bring you back to the beginning. Uh, and it gets you out of that area a little bit early. It's really the one time save we have on this level. So throughout this part of buying incinerate and coming back to the main area, we want to set up another death warp. However, there's a lot of enemies. And it's a little scary. Well, another glimpse at the big sister. We're going to buy incinerate. Be really careful not to buy anything else. Uh, we need every little bit of atom we can get. It is very important. Oh, hello. This blaster came out of nowhere. Okay. Take a little bit of damage here. So now we also get introduced uh, to another mechanic in the big sister. Once you've theoretically like saved or harvest uh it's typically like every third little sister you'll spawn in one of these big sisters that will come and hunt you down and fight you um so we want to die in this rubble also very specifically so that we get past this locked door which is stopping us um from getting back to the train station that screech is the big sister just coming after us. Uh, we actually want to kill her. because She also has Adam on her. We just want to start this process of Sinclair coming out and starting up the train. And she'll just come and track us down. She'll be on the next screech. I like to look a man in the eye when I give him my so Sinclair kind of takes the place of Atlas from Bioshock 1. He's going to be our guide through uh, a lot of Bioshock 2. Um... For now, we have the big sister to deal with. And we're through Orion's amusement. So, Popper's Drop is where things start to kind of break. Uh, there is a splicer surf that we can do here. Uh, unfortunately, it's still so new that even through all of my practice, because uh, I am doing pretty much daily practice of this for Summer Games Done Quick coming up, where I'll be running this game and Amnesia Rebirth. Uh, I have not done the Splicer Surf well enough to actually save time over the method we're going to be doing tonight. So, still going to be working on it in practice. Maybe we'll have a little bit of a different route come SGDQ. But uh, for tonight, we're going to save the Splicer Surfing for uh, Siren and onward. Still some fun stuff to do in this map, though. This is where we actually get the ability to go fast. We get introduced to the Brute Splicer as well. It's kind of cool, you know, just your standard larger than other enemy enemy. And we're going to make our way to the Gathers Garden, where we're going to spend all of this atom we've acquired. We're going to buy a Plasmid slot. We're going to buy Decoy, Winter Blast, replacing uh, Electro Bolt, and then Drill Lurker. We buy two Plasmids and Drill Lurker, which uh, does more damage for unaware enemies. Uh, and the rest is very, very important. Make a quick save. And we're going to put down this decoy, which is going to keep this brute occupied for a little bit. This brute is supposed to spawn in and kind of uh, tease you and say, hey, go follow me over this way. So you can eventually take a picture of me and learn Drill Dash. However, we don't want to do all of that. We just want to use this brute. So we're going to use the decoy to keep him spawned in. Should we walk back out? Okay. Then we're going to freeze them to keep them in place even longer. 
Grab the camera. We don't do this fast enough. He does just eventually despawn. Oh, we need to take a picture of this splicer to open up the door. No, now we need to take a picture. Hit him with Wonder Blast. Hit him with Incinerate. Let's get Drill Dash. Uh, he'll disappear here in a second. And I'm going to use this machine to Death Warp. Just die off here. Typically, once we get Drill Dash um, and the more recent route, we would use this to then go Splicer Surf here. Um, so this is where the route kind of deviates. I'm just going to make our way to the Sinclair Deluxe. For Grace. The paradise of Andrew Ryan. So Drill Dash not only allows us to actually move fast, uh, it allows us to like break down a wall like this, getting us into the Sinclair Deluxe, and we can just run through here real fast. Now Drill Dash does cost Drill Fuel, which you can see in the bottom left of the game screen, the little Drill Fuel meter. So the more we use it, the more we have to acquire fuel, which the easiest way to do that is just to buy it. Uh, so money does kind of play a part in the routing for this. For the most part, it doesn't matter a whole lot. We usually have tons of money. I'm just picking it up along the way. But that just doesn't mean we need to make the occasional stop just to pick up the fuel. Fun little thing about decoy in this game. Um, target dummy in the first, is they can actually use the open doors from afar. The game will count it as the player itself actually standing next to the door. So if you're approaching a door and you want it open a little bit sooner, you just put down your plasma in front of it. Which, combined with drill dashing, we can open it from afar and start our drill dash further. Just continue it. It's really, really nice. Small optimizations. So all we need to leave Popper's Drop is this key, and then we have to get back to the train. So we're going to grab this and just book it out of here. Grace is one of the three characters that you're supposed to sort of interact with along the way, and the game judges your morality to see how you deal with them, whether you kill them off, whether you just are neutral towards them, uh, and that affects one of the multiple different endings you can get. There's a little little sister ending, depending on how, uh, how many you save, harvests, it's a mix, and then there's one based on the three characters you meet along the way, Grace being one. You're a bigger man than I am, Chief. Maybe next time she'll think... So instead of just dashing all the way through, we can jump down to the entrance. Now, let's be on our way. Eleanor's waiting. Just drill dash back. You had me under a gun, yet you just walked With splicer surfing, you could theoretically skip drill dashing as well, but it is so useful for traversing the maps that it's not really worth it. I know that Dr. Lamb is no liar, but she's got to be wrong about you. Doesn't seem right now. Okay. Siren's Alley is where we get into the splicer surfing shenanigans. I was mentioning it a little bit ago, they are infinitely harder to do in two than one. Uh, just because the general movement and how things work in this game are not as clean, uh, I guess is the best way to describe it. There's a little bit more jank to everything. You're a big daddy, so you like have this weight around you. Um, and Sinclair's message here just gets bugged by... Who knows? Uh, diary skips and stuff don't go through levels. So although we did a diary skip on Ryan's Amusement, it didn't play into Popper's Drop. We still had messages playing. We didn't do any diary skips in Popper's Drop, so it shouldn't mess up. It just happens to glitch out here, which is really interesting. Uh, back in the water for a little bit. The game's showing us, much like Bioshock 1, here's the exit. Here's your way to Dionysus Park. Go do something else first. <laughs> Just gonna run away. Don't really need to pick up these slugs, it's kinda 
fun to do. Gives you something to interact with. At this point in Bioshock 2, you pretty much have everything you need just to beat the game. Obviously, we need drill fuel that we'll be picking up, but uh, we have plasmids we want. We have all of the things we need. We will pick up the grenade launcher in a little bit in Dionysus Park, but that's about it. Uh, so I'm going to save. We're going to have to set up these splicers. So we're going to freeze this guy. You can actually freeze them a couple times. Uh, once your blast does stack, so if you hit them with more than one blast at a time, it does stack the timer from how long they're being frozen. It's pretty cool. I'm going to buy some more drill fuel while he's sitting here. We're going to do a hard save. You can tell which levels we have a trouble with in the run based on <laughs> where the saves are. Siren's Alley and Popper's Drop. So we're going to wait for him to unfreeze, run away a little bit, freeze him again. And we want him to come attack us. A certain spot in his animation here will let me walk just casually on top of his head. Now if I just hit him with my drill, he's going to just shatter into a billion pieces, so I need to melt him first. Um... I want to get him right in the water. One thing you'll notice, anytime I save on top of a body, I'm going to do a load as well. Um, for whatever reason, if you quick save in this game, when you load back in, uh, it puts you in a standing position, and if you stand after you've crouched on top of these bodies doing the trick, uh, you just drop off of it. So we have to do a quick load so that we're crouching again. And there's like two types of pulls that tele telekinesis can give you can give you a very strong pull um or just gives you a lot of force and momentum like that and that's getting me stuck in the ceiling i need a very weak pull so that i can throw this body over to the door so that it's a little bit more tricky a very nice throw though let me make sure i I'm on the body. Okay. I want to make sure I'm actually on the body before I make a save and have to set everything back up. Uh, but now we're going to use this to just clip on through. Okay, didn't quite make it. So now I need kind of a strong pull into the door. It's okay if we kind of get stuck into the door as long as we're through the side. We can just wiggle our way. We're past there, which is usually a really big fight that kind of teaches you about the spider splicers. So that's the tricky part up here. Pick up some supplies as we just drill dash through here. So we're coming up on, it's supposed to be like a boss fight. It's basically a stronger version of a spider splicer. Uh, Simon Wales, who holds the keys to Dionysus. Try to kill off some just basic enemies, nothing crazy here. And use a mixture of incinerate and our machine gun. We got a brute to fight. For large enemies, the best way to deal with them is to hit them with Winter Blast and then just keep them frozen. Uh, when they're frozen, they actually have like a separate health bar you can kind of see. Must be some size. Uh, and if that's done, um, you can kind of see it like desyncs from the, the green there. If that hits the bottom of their health bar before their health does, then they die all the same. And we just keep comboing Winter Blast to keep that down low. That was Simon Whale. Um, nothing too crazy. Now we need to Death Warp. One of the few Death Warps we get to do in this run. We didn't get to see it in Bioshock 1 because we skip Incinerate these days. Uh, but in that game, you can just use Incinerate on the floor most of the time and just stand in it to take damage. And it's not the case for Bioshock 2. Uh, you actually need to set something else on fire first. It's a little bit annoying, but... 
Not too bad. So using decoy to open up the doors. And just walk on our way back. This is the door that we just clipped through. And I'm buying some drill fuel real quick. So to open up Dionysus, we need to flood Siren. So we're going to go into a little bit of a underwater section here, which is really cool. Once again, I wish they had expanded upon this more. Get to see it all, all flooded. Because we death warped out of the uh, control station, uh, and we get over to this airlock like way before we're supposed to, we can pull out our weapons again, which is not something you're supposed to be able to do. Uh, which means we can pull out our drill and drill dash into the water and just get through these a little bit faster than just walking. Okay. Uh, in the Dionysus we go. Dionysus, you're supposed to typically interact with more little sisters. Uh, there's three of them around the map that you need to either save or harvest. It doesn't matter which. It just kind of progresses the narrative of the level. And... Uh, you deal with Stanley, who is the second of the three characters that kind of judge your morality. Uh, we're not going to do any of that. We just gotta, it's gotta get to the train station, which means a lot of jewel dashing. We're just gonna keep buying fuel when we can. Uh, Houdini splicers make an appearance here. They just like pop into the map once again. Incinerate machine gun rounds. Pretty effective. So when we can. We want to winter blast and drill uh, when it's further away, incinerate, and machine gun rounds are typically the way to go. This used to be a spot where we set up a diary skip, um, the like the frame perfect one that skips all the messages for the remaining parts of the level. But because there's not actually anything stopping us from a dialogue standpoint for the new route, we don't have to do that anymore, which is really, really nice. Yeah. Whenever you can take frame perfect tricks out of the route. So that's a win win. So we're actually going to buy a little bit of Eve as well. So we want to make sure to have a lot of Eve going into the next map, Fontaine Futuristics. Grab herself a grenade launcher real quick. Okay. So before I go through the store, I want to save. We're going to be setting up another splice with Surf here. As soon as I walk through here, the splice is going to stand up. We're going to freeze them. Take care of the rest. Keep them frozen. Okay. So right here is the train station. This is where you meet Stanley and gives you the quest. Um, but it's also just the train to leave. So we're going to get the body over here. So that was a really nice pull. Uh, because telekinesis is a lot harder to control in this game. We can't really use it to make little micro adjustments with the body, so we just hit it with the drill. And then we try to clip in far enough to hit this switch. We did a little bit more. Oh. That's... Okay, that's crazy. <laughs> In fact, that's not far enough is just insane. All right, cool. So whenever you hit that switch, it like forces you to look at the store and then it's going to run through like 20 seconds of just nothing. Then the door's going to open and the train will advance. It's very strange. But we don't really get the time to relax because we don't have the whole train moving into the station once we load in the Fontaine Futuristics. It just goes. And there's splicers right off the start that also just start walking. Uh, and we need those splicers in a certain spot for another splicer surf here. So we got to go real fast. This is also why we want to make sure to have Eve. End of the line. If I'm right, Eleanor's mama's using so this guy walks just to the right spot that we can walk on his head as long as we keep him frozen. And the further we go through the game, the uh, the shorter amount of time Wonder Blast actually keeps an enemy frozen for. So the further and further we go, uh, the more I have to freeze them, or the quicker I have to do the scuff. So, get on top of the head, using some tricky jumps. Uh, and we're taking this body for an adventure. 
this is kind of like the Neptune's Bounty meets Apollo Square of uh, Bioshock 2. So, you're going to see a lot of saving and loading here. Actually got stuck on the rail here. Yeah, it is very easy with a strong telekinesis grab to just get stuck in walls. If you can get a weak pull, you can potentially throw the body towards the airlock over here. Oh, from here, we're just going to smack the body with the drill a whole bunch. There's not a great science to this. It's just kind of smack it and see where it goes. Um... Now we need to open up the airlock, so we need to be close enough to this control that we can hit it, but not close enough to the actual door. Uh, otherwise, when we open this, the body's going to start floating away, which is really bad. Uh, so we need it. Uh, we'll see. That might work. So another trick that we have to do for this is once we hit this airlock, it's going to take away our plasmids. So we're just going to keep cycling through them. Uh, and if we do this correctly, it's just going to let us keep the plasmids. Once again, in a spot we're not supposed to have them. The body's not floating away. And I walked off of it. That's a no-no. Uh, so there's like a certain size to the hitbox here that you have to stand on. It's a little tricky to judge exactly where that hitbox is. Okay, that time I did not keep my plasmids. The body doesn't get spotted. I just need to pull it out. Uh, and once we're on the water section, things do not get any easier for us. We need to get up high enough so that we maintain our ability to actually use telekinesis here. We're going to start going through no player zones like we did for Apollo Square and Bioshock 1. First, we need to get over here. It's a good throw. Another save load. Uh, I need to go up high enough, but not high enough that I get stuck. And then also throw the body... We're in no player zone here. Back beyond FF1, which I got first try. That's extremely, extremely good. Um, so that skips all of FF1. Now we just use this to get over to FF2. This map is split into two parts. Um, the first part deals with... I don't even remember his name. I'm going to be honest, it's been a while. Uh, but part two deals with... Alexander Gill, the third of the, the morality choices. Um, so that was really, really nice. <laughs> That's uh, one of the scarier ones. Okay. This is where we also get to see the alternative way to do diary skips. So we don't have an all-in-one like frame-perfect diary skip for this. We're just going to save, load, and then play a message uh, to get past that one. Just a couple times here. Uh, we're gonna hack this real quick. I must admit, it is I want to buy a couple supplies, mainly Eve, which I don't have any money. That's fantastic. A save load again. At this point, if you see me doing a save load, it's just to bypass some dialogue here. There's a look based trigger. Meaning, the faster we look at that, the faster this part will start. Okay. So we're going to save, load, skip this message, and then do another trick where we're going to try to pick up multiple of these flowers. There's four of these around the map that you're supposed to get. But if you interact with this enough in a quick enough time, which we did not get there, um, you can actually pick up four flowers off of this one. So when that red flashes, three, four. Okay, well, we might even get more. So yeah, five. The more we get, um, which we're going to see a lot of, uh, it's going to spawn more and more alpha daddies here. You just need four uh, for the level. To, like that's how much you need for the level. Um, two alpha daddies are always going to spawn here. Um, just when you pick up the first one. If you pick up like five or six, then you get a second wave. You pick up more than that, keep spawning. Uh, it is possible to spawn like an absolute uh, 
what's a nice way of saying it? Um, just a monstrably high amount of Alpha Daddies. Uh, you like really do it perfectly. Um, for this trick in particular, we have, or at least I have, interact bound to my mouse wheel so I can just scroll really, really fast. But you don't want to scroll fast enough to spawn in more splicers, or more alpha daddies, rather. Uh, they're not going to give you anything. You don't want to, like, free scroll mouse wheel it. Or macro it. Okay, so we have a little bit of a fight sequence to end the level here. A lot going on here. The only things that really matter here are the alpha daddies. Splicer's not so much. But sometimes this Alpha Daddies get stuck. Okay. Should have one more. Unfortunately, I'm really low on supplies. How dare you try to buy me out? Okay, I guess I miscounted because I was the third. Okay, sweet. You know, going faster than I thought. Son, you reel him in. A whole bunch of skips. Uh, so yeah, you pick up one flower here, and then you run around the map to find the others, and then you come back here for that fight. So we skip from picking up the first flower to the end fight for the map. There's already a key there, because it's glitched out. So once we spawn another, it just uh, makes a duplicate. It is now we're leaving FF2 and going into the last couple maps of the game. Of electricity to the tank. More than enough to kill me. Whatever I may say. While we're not like, really doing a splicer surf, it's going to be the, the same sort of mechanic. Only telekinesis is not going to work here. So we're going into outer Persephone, which is a very notorious level for speedrunning these days. My feeble prayers. Perhaps after my death, you can do more. Now, please. The reason telekinesis is not going to work here is because we're going to use a big sister body this time around. And telekinesis does not work on big sister bodies. So we're going to have to do some other fun shenanigans to do a splicer surf like trick to clip through a door without using telekinesis. And, uh, sometimes this can be a bit of a troll. Eleanor, son, and fast. Her mama's got all rapture dying to keep you two apart. As far as what is this is attempting to skip, uh, if you've played this game, this is the part where you finally meet up with Eleanor and you get to see into the world of little sisters and how they see rapture, which is really cool. Honestly, one of the better parts of the game. From a casual perspective, it's just really, really slow. So we're just gonna drill dash to Eleanor. I wonder, Delta, do you know why you are here? Have you any idea what my daughter has given you? Fortunately, money's a little low this run. I envy your ignorance. You still believe. So before the big sisters spawn in here, we can do a little prep work. So we're gonna start moving. Some of these canisters to the spawn point. No matter what you might be feeling right now, this is business. Get that cage open. She's coming with us. Grab some supplies as well. All right. How will she remember us? Move this rock. It'll become important later. I have placed my pieces on the board, as expected. As have you. Is this what she hoped for? Mother and father. If you get uh. You have a lot of money here. You can just buy a whole bunch of proxy mines. So kind of helps out. Uh, there are two big sisters that spawn in here. We need to kill one off and then get the other one to basically one hit. So it's not like imperative that you deal enough damage off the rip, but uh, you know, the faster you get that first big sister down, the better. I need to be careful with Winter Blast here if I'm doing this to Knots. 
let that drop too low. Uh, I'm going to save just in case I happen to kill her. We don't have to do the rest of the level over again. Uh, and big sisters are very annoying to set up for splicer surfing stuff because they don't really like to be in the same spot for more than a couple seconds. They like to jump around. Uh, so we're going to get the big sister to jump off this little pipe and then over towards the staircase. Uh, keep her frozen. Kind of in a bad spot. Okay. Sometimes she'll go like right underneath and be too tall. Wait on you, sunshine. All right, let's see. And behave. Okay. So I'm not going to kill her right here. I'm actually going to try um, on top of her to use decoy to potentially lure her around. Looks like so. We can't use telekinesis. On her body. So if I drop her here, then the fun begins where she dies. So if we can use decoy and Winter Blast to get her up these stairs. That's for the best. Um, she doesn't really like to stand in one spot. Sometimes we'll just jump around, which is a big nuisance. Uh, okay. It's not a great science to this. <laughs> so if she takes too long to go up the stairs, then I'll just start the fun. But uh, the longer I can go... Without having to use this table, the better. All right. Let's see. <laughs> One more shot. Let's see if she's going to run up there. Sometimes she'll run up there right away, and it is really, really nice. load back in. So because we don't have the ability to use telekinesis directly on top of the body, we're going to use telekinesis on these tables and use this to push the body. Which is uh, very, very inconsistent. So... We can use the drill, which is sometimes helpful. Uh, the body is also not like a great hitbox, so sometimes it just gets stuck. So we're going to try to get her close to the stairs and then use the table to push us up the stairs. And then once we're up there, use the table to push us through the door. Uh, telekinesis is also really weird in this game that it likes to pick up random things from around the map. So even though I'm looking at this table, it's probably going to try to pick up this candle. Yeah, so uh, that happens a lot, which is also just a fun little quirk about telekinesis. We might see some rocks get picked up at some point. All right. We get past this part. The rest of two is pretty easy in comparison. Uh, we only have one level after this as well, so get past this, we're pretty much on the infinite. Okay, drop the table. Let's move the body a little bit. Uh, there is like an ideal way to have this body lined up, but uh, you know, with how how these things go, you don't always get what you want. Do another save load and then hope we can just pop through real quick. So give it a couple tries. If it doesn't work, then we'll try moving the body a little bit. But even though this seems like a very long, convoluted, messy setup, um, the casual part of this is so long that it's actually like faster even if you take multiple attempts to do this. Like this is still just saving time. All right, let's move the body a little bit. 
Yeah, there's like a cutscene with Eleanor, and then you run through this big fetch quest, and then you have like another cutscene to go through. It is... It's a cool segment, but also a really, really slow one to do. Try and spin this body around. Bodies really like to like get twisted up when you start hitting them with the drill. It's always a weird pretzel scenario. All right, let's see if this clips any better. <laughs> yeah, so there's telekinesis being great telekinesis again and pulling a different table from across the map. A little bit of a clip. I think I got stuck in the door and then dropped out of it. I see. Okay. That body actually looks a lot better. So there is like an ideal way to like set this up that tends to be more clippy than others. Not great. Body went through. Hey, there we go. All right. A little bit awkward, a little bit strange, but that's how speedruns go sometimes. But Enter Persephone is the last level. We're going to do a save because we are going to do another diary skip here. Got it. First try. That one's actually based off of a uh, movement trigger. So as soon as you like, start moving, it plays out. So it's a little bit easier to time. Get used to. Uh, we're going to buy up some Eve hypos. All right. So we're going to use a Brute Splicer for this clip. He's a little bit more cooperative, although a little troublesome at times. Uh, first, we need to clear off all of the other enemies. So get these guys out of here. So there's like three big wings uh, that you have to go do different quests for. And you come back here to open up the end. We're just going to not kill this brute. Uh, get him low enough that we can stand on his head and then use him to clip through that door up there. Bring him down to one shot, and then he should, like Thuggish Blasters, try to get in melee range. We're gonna set him up on these stairs. He's kind of a nice guy, and he'll just kind of like stand here. Uh, it's not quite the right height. Let's see. I'm just gonna get him to kind of adjust himself. Oop. Okay. I'm not sure what happened there, but physics are going to physics. All right. Come back up here. In the corner. There you go. That looks, that looks real nice. Okay. So I'm going to decoy in the corner. Oop. Ah, uh, frozen like mid attack. I see. Okay. I'm going to decoy up those stairs. Brute is a little bit more consistent in the fact that he likes to charge at enemies and not shoot them from afar. Got knocked off from the melee again. Okay. So the Brute, despite being bigger than regular enemies, uh, we can use Telekinesis here. We just need to go a little bit further and then clip through this door. Uh, once we clip through here and hit the elevator, that's where time for Bioshock 2 ends. So we'll stop the run and go with the infinite. Just gotta clip through. Uh, like 95% of the way on that clip. Cool. Okay. There we go. And that is Bioshock 2. 
can quit out of that, go to infinite. And that is all of the splicer surfing that you're going to see. Infinite has other ways of running through the game. We're going to go main menu. Uh, this one does not start from a save file. We're going to start it from it's the main menu here. And then you may notice that little hat icon in the top left, that little gray icon. Sometimes it's hard to see depending on your monitor. Uh, that means we are running the Hillrunners hat mod. Uh, that icon is what verifies that we're using it. Uh, the Hillrunners hat mod is a mod that the community has allowed for runs that grants us the Hillrunners hat gear, which is a very awesome gear um, in Battleship Bay. The reason we've done this is otherwise there aren't there are certain tricks that you cannot do without Hillrunner's hat, um, and to go as fast as possible to get really good times, you have to get Hillrunner's hat. Unfortunately, it's a one in fifty-two drop, uh, and to grind out for it, it's like thirty seconds per attempt of checking a certain item, and you can go thirty minutes without getting it. So instead of having runs reset thirty minutes into the game over not getting the right drop, the community has decided, hey, let's just mod out this random drop uh, and grant every runner Hellrunner's hat. And is our super awesome movement through the game. So, much like Bioshock 2, uh, this game is run at very low quality settings. But unlike Bioshock 2, it's not because of crashing issues. You run at low stuff so that we can have really high FPS, which is needed for certain tricks. We've arrived. There's actually like a, a varying degree of FPS that you need for this game. Sometimes having too high of a frame rate is a bad thing, and other times as high as you can get it uh, is good. Somebody meeting me here? So this game does not take place in Rapture, although we're going to a lighthouse. We're actually going to make our way up to Columbia, the city in the sky. A little departure from the old ways. Where we play is Booker DeWitt, who's been tasked to go to Columbia, find the girl, and that will wipe away his gambling debts that he's occurred. bit of a lovely intro. If you look up, you can get the rain on your face. Feels so good. While Bioshock 1 and 2 have very similar gameplay, even if it's slightly different between between the two, uh, Infinite has very different gameplay. Uh, it still has guns, it still has plasmids in this, they're called Vigors instead. Um, that stuff still behaves sort of the same, but we don't have telekinesis for instance, uh, unfortunately, uh, I could only imagine what the runs would be like if we did. Uh, but just the general combat and stuff is, is very, very different. It means we have very different types of skips. All right. Looks but we have to actually get into Columbia before all that stuff takes place. Much like the opening of Bioshock 1, the grand entrance to Rapture. We got a very grand entrance into Columbia. No, no, God damn it. Ascension. Ascension. Whoa. So pretty. And while this game is 
a really fun, fantastic game to play and run. I would one day love to uh, see like the pre-development builds eventually leak online. Like retro games are kind of starting to nowadays. So if you go back and look at those early trailers, even like right before release, it was a wildly different game and I would love to mess around in that. You can see where stuff's carried over through design, but man, <laughs> could have been running a very different game in a different universe. We've now made it into Columbia, but not quite into the city proper. First, we have to meet a blind priest. Well, one big difference that we've already noticed, I'm sure people have noticed, between <laughs> 1, 2, and then Infinite, uh, is the fact that Booker talks. You know, Jack and Bioshock 1 and Subject Delta and 2. Very silent protagonist. Or is, uh, he's not quite the same. He likes, likes to say stuff. Sometimes it's the wrong stuff, but boy, does he like to talk. Get out of our comfy chair and we can start sprinting around again. Sprinting is another thing that's very different from one and two. Excuse me. Where am I? Two at least gets drill dash. It's not just walking. And every year on this day of days, we recommit ourselves to our city and to also have no reflection. We are a vampire. Is it someone new? This blind priest is going to uh, give us a little baptism. Or I guess he's a preacher. Well, is there a difference between a preacher and a priest? I just need passage into the city. Passage to the city. Brother, the only way to Columbia is through rebirth. Now, once we get past here, much like getting past the early stages of Bioshock 2, uh, that's where the game really starts to open up. I just start doing some interesting things. Very different from what we've seen so far. I don't know, brothers and sisters, but this one doesn't look... So, throughout the game, you kind of get these glimpses, as we'll see here, of Booker's room. Kind of like a flashback. Piecing the pulse together. It leaves you in a mystery of, like, what's happening. You can see this gambling... Uh, stuff there. Hear these mysterious voices. Get a little glimpse of New York. See Columbia up there in the top right. Just gotta wake up and then we're off. Because the angel Columbia that idiot priest needs to learn the difference between baptizing a man he and drowning across one. the Delaware with flaring I need to find a landmark and figure out where the hell I am Booker's still trying to figure out exactly what Columbia is and how it all works uh, this is a big series of interconnecting and ever-changing islands you can see them kind of float together which kind of tries to prevent you from going fast but uh, you know you can do whatever you want. Jump around, get past stuff. Uh, this little walkway right here is actually the main menu. Uh, that's where you click on new game and stuff. A little, a little detail. Uh, so this is the parade that you normally have to wait for, but uh, with high FPS, you can do wall clips of sort by just kind of like rubbing against the wall. This one's a little bit slow. Getting a little stuck here. What? Maybe not doing a parade skip today. <laughs> I 
very slow parade skip, but uh, yeah, we clip through the invisible wall holding us back. Just keep on going. So those clips are easier to do. They're faster to clip through with higher FPS. Um, and I'm not just talking back uh, 144 or 200. Uh, for most things I do, uh, I'm currently running at 500 FPS. You could run higher, but um, with streaming and everything, it tends to cause some encoding issues. So, talking about you know, the higher you can go, for the most part, the better. Not always the case. But uh, now we've gotten past the parade, we need to get past the raffle. There's a few different ways you can do this. The simplest and usually the fastest is just to jump on these signs, I jump over that out of bounds, and then we're going to jump into a different part of the map. Just past the raffle, it's going to load in. Just like that, we've skipped the entire raffle section. Which is typically where you get, like, the Skyhook. Um, and you usually get, like, the Devil's Kiss Vigor. Which, thankfully, the game is going to give us a Skyhook, and we can always get Vigors later on. It's actually better that we do so. Um, because the first time you pick up a Vigor, it has a animation that you go through. Um, these pop-ups are the fact that I have DLC installed, which grants me these handy-dandy infusions. So, Salt is the equivalent to Eve in the first game for your plasmids. Um, we're just going to get a whole bunch of these. Uh, we're going to pick up two of these gears. One's Fleet Feet and one is Sugar Rush. So Fleet Feet allows you to strafe faster sideways and back. Which kind of comes into play late in the game. Um, and Sugar Rush means if you pick up a drink or a food, you run faster. For a short amount of time, which is super useful. Uh, you know, going fast is really good for a speedrun. Um, yeah, Vigors have an animation the very first time you encounter them in the game, but if you pick them up any time after that, even if it's the first time interacting with it, you don't get that animation. So we're going to jump down in this window, pick up our Devil's Kiss, where we don't get an animation. We have our sky hook for these little handy dandy hops. I'm going to shoot so that these enemies get alerted and open the door. So a lot of times I don't need to kill enemies, but I am looking to see if maybe they're going to drop some food. So combined with Sugar Rush, we can get a little bit of a speed boost. There are certain items around the map that are hard-coded in. Like, there's always going to be an apple here you can pick up for that little speed boost, but... Sometimes you can get lucky killing an enemy. Uh, but we get salt infusions because vigors are very useful, especially for combat later in the run. And uh, we're going to do a lot of death warping as well, so we don't actually want more health and we don't want more shields. So that would just be counterproductive. So being a little safe in this route, I'm going to max out my salts eventually, and I will never pick up an infusion for health or shields, uh, which we'll touch on death warping uh, once we get to like Battleship Bay. We need to make our way to Monument Tower, where Elizabeth, the girl, is currently awaiting. So this is our second vigor we're supposed to get introduced to, the Murder of Crows. It's another one that we're just going to leave behind. We're not going to get every vigor. We're going to get a lot of them. Um, because a lot of them are really, really useful. Like this. Uh, just kill off that crow. The crows always like to spawn behind you. So I just plant down those devil kiss traps. Is the door going to open? Okay. That felt really slow. Um, he'll just die when he spawns in. You're going to see me shake my mouse a lot when I do these jumps. If you don't, your mouse kind of gets locked into a little bit of an animation whenever you grab those or a sky rail itself. But by shaking your mouse a whole lot, uh, you kind of break out of that and can jump off of those faster. And this is kind of fun to do. No luck on items. Uh, 
So something you can do on rails is jump further along. It's never really faster to go on the rail or jump ahead. Um, like either way, it's uh, basically the same time. One thing we're going to try to do, let's see, give this one good shot. Uh, so if you time it just right, you can get stuck in that cargo box, and it speeds you up along this rail like really, really fast amounts. So you zip over here instantly, and you can do a little bit of a another skip. Cannot jump off of this. Uh, and you have to like do this chain of jumping around. It's not really worth doing more than one attempt for, but it's always fun to go for. A little fun fact about these sky rails, if you look at them, you can actually see through them. Uh, it's a nice little quality of life thing that maybe you didn't notice casually. So they're not blocking your screen. First real introduction to Comstock, the protagonist of the game. He is, uh, I was going to say Eleanor, getting things confused. Um, Elizabeth's father. I just have to ride this elevator up. Uh, so we're about to get onto this airship. So once it goes up a little bit, we can actually plant some Devil Kiss traps onto it by just throwing them. That way we don't have to deal with the enemies running out of this in just a moment. We can kill them a little bit faster. You don't know me, pal. Prophecy is my business, Mr. DeWitt. As blood is yours. Do you know why these men will die for them? Because I have seen their future in the glory. The glory. And hence One thing you can do with this if you run it a whole lot is this video playing is actually a cutscene file you can replace. Just put whatever you want here. If you know, run this whole bunch and you get tired of looking at his face, you can just put some other video file there instead. The nosebleeds have a very um, important part in the narrative of this. We're going to be running past most of that, you know, as you tend to do on a speedrun. We do get a little bit of story here and there throughout this run. But uh, the whole nosebleed part we kind of bypass over. game still going through the whole introducing all of the the world parts of the game trying to get you familiar with stuff this is the last map before we go to the tower itself this is where Elizabeth not Eleanor is uh is kept and once we get through tower things get even crazier There's no combat here to like get some speed boost, but there are a few handy dandy little things we can pick up along the way. Some cans of beans, cans of coffee, stuff like that. That's where Sugar Rush really shines. A little hidden infusion we can pick up back behind this desk. A nice 168 hour quarantine, lovely. Who doesn't like a nice quarantine? So, uh, <laughs> the, the whole series loves its elevators. Uh, nowadays, we don't really sit through many elevators in Bioshock 1. 2 still has the long one in Atlantic Express, but we do get a nice healthy dose of those in Infinite. Here we see Elizabeth for the first time, the girl. So she's just kept locked up in this tower. They've been watching her her whole life, studying her. Very creepy. 
uh, and disturbing. So he's going to run off. We're going to follow. It is very convenient that uh, just runs one room over. It's also just like a really strange room to have set up at all, but you know, we get a, a very quick glimpse at tears. Tears are like the big thing about infinite, as we will not see because we're just going to bypass everything. Um, tears are. Portals into alternate timeline dimension hopping stuff. It gets kind of convoluted as things go on, but Elizabeth has the power to open up tears to other places and pull things through. And occasionally in combat, she will throw us supplies depending on what we need. If we're really low on health, she's going to try to find us health. If we're low on ammo, she's going to try to find us ammo. So we can kind of manipulate the things that she gives us. Like, we're really low on ammo. We can just keep spamming reload. And she's like, oh, are you looking for ammo? Here you go. Like a grand entrance. Stop it. Will you stop it? Not here to hurt you. Who are you? My name is DeWitt. Also, I have no idea how she actually gets into this room. Um, this is a game that uh, the more you like try to break things down and think about them, the less that makes sense. But that door behind her is locked, and the other one has a gate on it, and there's no other entrances. You, you've got to go. Why? You don't want to be here when he gets here. Just a minute, I'm getting. She's kind of popped into here. No way out. Trust me, I've looked. Stop it! You're you're too impatient. That's enough. What about this? What about it? This is the way out, isn't it? What are you? Give it to me. Yeah, so this has like a gate on it already. This is the door that we get open. Um, and that's that's about it, so. I'm not quite sure how she gets in here, but she does. Ah, we freed her. Jailbreak. Uh, what you're hearing uh, running around, or I guess flying around, screeching, is Songbird, the... Guardian Protector, uh, essentially the big daddy to Elizabeth's little sister. He does not like the fact that we are trying to free her. Uh, so he's going to be hunting us down, breaking apart the tower. If he wants to protect Elizabeth, uh, it's a very odd way of doing it. <laughs> She's very likely to die from the mayhem as well. What is all this? They were watching me all this time. Why? Why did they put me in here? What am I? What am I? You're the girl who's getting out of this tower. Hello. Songbird's pretty dang cool. This way. Got a little taste of the Bonk Bonk song, which will come in the full force once we actually escape, but you know, a little fan favorite track. Just the classic Bonk Bonk. Once we get a checkpoint here, we're actually going to reload this checkpoint. This allows us to run up here faster. We can actually outrun Elizabeth even. Okay. 
So we've gotten out of the tower, going for a fun ride around Columbia real quick. We'll listen to the great music, and then we will be entering Battleship Bay, where the run really comes to its full power. You might be thinking to yourself, how do they live through any of this ever? Um, no idea. There are many spots where Booker's arm should just be ripped out of its socket from grabbing onto the rail lines, fall into the water, whatever it may be. Uh, but, you know, he will just never give up. A really quick flashback. So we were mentioning the Hellrunners had at the very beginning of the Infinite Run. Uh, this is where that mod will actually kick into effect. When we go to find the first gear no, it's in here, here. Um, this is where that will uh, will happen. So before, when we didn't have Hellrunner's Hat mod, we got this far into the infinite runs before doing a grind for a 1 in 52 drop. So you can see why it's not ideal. Uh, it's still early in the run, but it's not that early for a reset. I won't be long. I won't be long, Mr. DeWitt. So she just leaves us on the beach and just runs off. I can't really blame her. Yeah, now we are on a beach in the sky. It all makes sense. A little cotton candy gives us a sugar rush boost. But another thing of cotton candy, nice. I right, gotta go stop her from dancing. Hey, miss it. Hey, miss. Miss Elizabeth. Hello. Oh, this is wonderful. Come dance with me, Mr. Dick. I don't dance. Come on, let's go. Why? Who can be better than this? Oh. How about Paris? Paris? How I don't understand. How could we get there? That's where that airship's going, but if you want to stay and dance, we can no, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go right now. Okay, now we've lied to Elizabeth and told her we're going to Paris when that's not the case for Booker. He still wants to take her to New York. Uh, we're just going to start running away. So we're running away from our problems. They're supposed to have already been introduced to the, the Lutest twins, uh, at least once before. But they're going to be right here, kind of stopping us from going until we talk to them. Uh, however, we can jump up on top of this little stand. We hit the corner just right. A little bit of a tricky skip to do. You can't just make the jump flat out. You actually have to like hit the side and then boost into the corner. Um, kind of like the parade skip. The walls and stuff don't really care for your FPS shenanigans. So we're just going to leave Elizabeth there with them kind of babysit for just a moment. Uh, it does a really fun thing in that she's supposed to 
show you these two boxes that she now conveniently has just stolen. Uh, one has a bird pendant, the other has a cage pendant. You're supposed to choose which one. Kind of prove that choices in the end don't matter, but you have to choose anyways. Uh, but because we didn't choose one, she's just going to hold on to the boxes for a little bit. So this gear right here is our Hellrunner's hat. Which means when our shield breaks, that little yellow bar in the top left, when that depletes, we will gain a really, really big speed boost. Is that box kind of freaking out? So what I did right there, uh, we jumped in the hallway and stored a text box. This is where you get introduced to Elizabeth giving you stuff in combat. Uh, we stored a coin that she gives us, the tutorial coin, and we can use that to pull her forward to start that little cutscene. Two tickets for passage. Uh, and as a ch choices narratively don't matter at all. Uh, for the speedrun, they don't really matter. Um, some are just a little bit faster than others. So here we're going to pull out our weapons. We have to fight here either way. So starting the fight sooner means we can end it sooner. It's typically how things go. Uh, she's like, oh no, you killed people. You're a monster and just runs away. Can't really blame her, but uh, we're going to have to go track her down once again. Got a couple things of supplies. Money is a little bit important in this run. We typically get enough for everything that we actually want. Um, if we get really lucky, we can get a couple of extra things along the way in terms of upgrades. Put some general looting here and there. So that yellow break you just saw on screen was the Hellrunner's hat uh, taking into effect. That was the shield breaking, and then we get the speed boost. Uh, and now Hellrunner's Hat speed boost and the Sugar Rush speed boost can stack. You those people. So if you break your shield and pick up food at the same time, you can go really, really fast. It doesn't happen too often, uh, but every now and then, there's some spots where we can stretch our legs and just run through a map. Do you understand the expense? She still has the stolen boxes on her wrist. You think people like that are just going to let you walk away? You are an investment, and you will not be safe until you are far away from here. What, what do they want from me? Unfortunately, once we leave the map and go into Soldier's Field, they go, they go away. It'd be really fun if they stuck around. You're bleeding. Come here. What happened? She also just never have a actual pendant on her necklace. I don't know. So we obviously did not choose one. Pick up this handy dandy banana over here. So the next couple sequence of maps uh, is a big a big version of what we were talking about in Bioshock 1 and 2 where the game shows you the exit and then gives you a quest to go and do something else. So we need to leave Soldier's Field and go up to the First Lady. But to do that we have to go over to uh, the Hall of Heroes and come back. We're just going to get past some cutscenes by skipping straight to the Hall of Heroes. This is a trick that uh, you do want reasonably high FPS, but one where too high of FPS is actually a problem. So, there it is. First it's our first real instance of that. Just stay close. Call me Booker. We're just gonna run past this point and do a jump around the map into the side of this wall, and then. Didn't quite jump far enough around. I imagine they were interested in meeting you. No doubt for lockpicking lessons. That allows us to climb up this wall, or like series of stacked walls. Yes, I got a bit behind with current events. Up on top of the map. Be sure to run on the invisible walls here, so we don't fall off. Now 
want to make sure I fall in just the right way. I'm going to like wait for my shield to regen a little bit. Drop here and then turn a little left. That gets us past the elevator. Into the section leading the Hall Heroes. So this is Bucking Bronco. We're going to pick this up on the way back. Uh, if we pick it up now, we get that animation I was talking about just a bit ago. A little five piece there. Oh, they did spawn over here. Okay. Need to kill off some enemies. Although we passed on Bucking Bronco, this is where we're going to get our Murder of Crows, which is a figure we passed up long ago before even the tower. Now we can just pick it up. No crazy animation. Okay. And now we have this for later. Not the most useful vigor. We use it for like one spot in particular. Uh, but uh, let me carry on. One big gameplay difference between the first two games and Infinite is Infinite only allows you to carry two guns at any given time. You can carry as many vigors as you want, but you can only have two guns. So we're going to be trading guns out a little bit here and there. Uh, right now we have this machine gun and the shotgun. We're going to give up the machine gun here in just a second for a rocket launcher. Which means we can start doing self-damage to break our shield and use Hellrunner's hat whenever we want. So you're going to see me shoot the ground a lot uh, and take some self-damage to break the shield and proc the speed boosts. Uh, I'm also going to purposely lower my health a little bit. So when I go in here, we can set up for a death warp. Uh, death warp once me uh, once again means we're going to die, so we can progress faster than we're supposed to. Um, in this game, we're going to be death warping through areas a lot. So uh, this one's pretty tough, but the goal is to oh my actual I see okay. That was a little weird. Uh, I need to actually take an extra hit. Okay. Um, I want to die as I'm flinging myself through this door. Okay, really? Um, and by doing so, I hope I get far enough to hit a checkpoint that's going to open this door. Sometimes you get down to one health and then you get like iframes and then taking more damage doesn't actually kill you. This first death warp is by far the hardest of the death warps in the entire game. There's actually three death warps we have to do in the Hall of Heroes alone. This one may take a couple tries. So we need to die while jumping through with the speed boost. Okay, so the door there did not open. Um, and the reason I'm reloading is because I've basically set my health up to the spot where I can take that first initial hit, and then the second one's going to kill me. We'll see. That looked pretty decent. This is definitely the hardest of the lot, so if we get past this, the rest should be... Yeah, okay. Relatively easy. Uh, however, this next death warp I'm going to do. I'm going to buy some more ammo. Uh, you actually don't want to go too far, otherwise you soft lock. So you want to go far enough that you uh, go past the door, but not far enough that you actually soft lock. Which I think this is good. So you jump too far, the enemies here don't spawn in, and then you can't leave Hall of Heroes when you need to. Okay. You run there to spawn in those enemies. And we're going to run away. We need to go do some other stuff first. So we're gonna, much like the first death warp we did, we're going to set up a speed boost and then jump far enough to get the trigger there. So seeing that message, collect shock jockey from slate means we actually did it correctly. We get a little bit of an indication ahead of time. Yeah. 
wake back up or run down here. That's going to open up this door for us. So things are coming from the side, but they actually load in slate, which has the electro uh, or the shock jockey we need. The equivalent to electro bolt. Uh, we need to run down here. Now he's conveniently here. We skip a whole big part about um, here, learning about how Elizabeth can not only pull stuff through tears to give to um, Booker, but that she can like spawn in stuff in the arenas that you run through. Uh, so we spare him just because it's faster. Once again, the choice doesn't really matter. So if you're wondering what the animations look like that I keep talking about, uh, something along the lines of this, it's pretty slow. It looks really cool. There's just no other point where we can get Shock Jockey later on. So we have to watch this one. Um, if we ever found a way to skip needing Shock Jockey, it would be probably the biggest skip in the game. Uh, factory skip is pretty big, but uh, the biggest thing really left to find. And now that we have that, we can go back to Soldier's Field and head towards the First, uh, first Lady. I can't actually use the rockets because I had no health. A lot of times when I'm searching bodies or like trash cans, I am looking for food just for the sugar rush, but also finding uh, big things of money is pretty nice. So we don't need a ton, but we can just happen to get some uh, lucky drops. Make the end game a little bit nicer. I actually have to wait here for the sky rail at the bottom to be powered once again. And be safe and stand here. Do a big old jump. Whee! So although this is the first spot you typically get Bucking Bronco, uh, because it's like a new map, it assumes we've already gotten it here. Uh, we don't get the animation, which is really nice. So we can just pick it up there, and now we have it. Bucking Bronco uh, lifts enemies up into the air. So once again, it's not like the most useful of things, but there's a few applications we can make use of it. Uh, for the most part, the only things I'm going to be using it for is lifting up very heavy enemies and knocking them off the map. Uh, pulling that lever and spawning in the gondola starts a fight that is also on a timer. We have some time to loot. Gotta make sure we kill off all the enemies that spawn in, and then we're good. Nothing too crazy. Some loot. So like bigger enemies, the firemen, the rocketeers, uh, you can sit there and just wail on them and they have a lot of health. Or you can just knock them off into the void, which is just a one-shot death. The Bucking Bronco and in melee works out pretty nicely for that. Not, uh, not the craziest thing. Well, quality of life. It's also a, a terrifying death. You have to be a little bit careful um, of knocking enemies off the map like that because there are spots in the game. It happens a lot on one of the fights later on where they can get like stuck on the side where they don't actually fall into the void. And they just kind of get like stuck under the map where you can't kill them and they don't despawn so the fight never ends. Now we're going to wait for enemies to come fight us over here. A lot of the enemies spawn on this rooftop and this one over here. So we can just kind of chill out on this corner. Of course that part of the map is very bright. But 
we're really waiting for this gondola over here to get down the lower. Oh, this guy's down here. Interesting. The enemy should uh, almost come to this back corner. Sometimes they'll like go around and you have to track them down. It doesn't happen too often. We're just waiting for more enemies. I think there should be Two more enemies that spawn in after this. She's gonna yell about the Patriot. And then there should be two more that spawn on this rooftop. Count it. Okay, so we actually do want to death warp out of the gondola. Oh, she's opening that. We're going to get our health down to one. So the developers were really smart in that they made these cables that run up the side not have collision. They're like, oh, why don't they just run up the cables leading right there? Trust me, we would love to, but developers were I'm thinking ahead. So we need to wait a little bit so we're far enough away from that platform. Um, we're closer to this one for the death warp respawn point to move up there. Thing you came along when you did. How do you think I ended up here? I gambled, and now I owe money to men you don't want to be in debt to. I come here to pay it back. Me busting you out. What do you think that was? It's a really good indication. Somebody who was willing to take my marker in exchange for you. It's right when they get done talking. Into that respawn here, you're going to see the gondola still coming up. After him. Another fun filled elevator ride. This one's actually pretty short. So, it's like they call you the false shepherd. And you the lamb. Let's not it's kind of a death warp that we set up through, uh, through levels here. I'm going to boost around, get another salt infusion for safety, get some money. And go ahead and try to leave. You all right? That kind of closes the chapter on. You can think of it. It's like part one, part two, um, where you've met Elizabeth, kind of freed her from the tower. Both get on the same page as to what's going on, what's happening. Now we're entering the factory segment of the game. I owed money. Introduces the. Uh, he offered to wipe away my debt in exchange for you. The other on, antagonists, gonna be okay. well, you sort of side character in Daisy Fitzroy and the Vox Populi. It's not one that we stick around with for too long. Factor actually has the biggest skip. It's also part of the game where you really start learning more about how the tears work. And the fact that you can actually traverse through different universes and timelines which is not a part of the game that we see. Let's give this a handy dandy cutscene. Elizabeth is gonna run off on her own. And leave us leave us behind. Booker takes even more at physical abuse. Fresh 
kind of get a glimpse of uh, a handyman much earlier on in the game, but get a real good look there. You Fitzroy. They're supposed to be the somewhat equivalents to big daddies from Rapture. Um, although it's also Songbird. Listen, I ain't looking for a fight. There's already a fight to win. Only question is, which side you on? Comstock is the god of the white man, the rich man, the pitiless man. But if you believe in common folk, then join the fox. If you believe in the righteous folk, then join I just the fox. Want my ship. And the fox shall give her to you. But first, you must help the fox. Down in Finkton is a gun. Yeah, so although we've gotten our airship to take Elizabeth back to New York. We now have to go do another quest line to get back our ship that we just got. We somehow survived this fall. And off we go. So we do get a little bit of a consistent sugar rush plus Hellrunner's hat boost right here. See exactly how fast you run. It's pretty nutty. Brief taste of speed. Okay, so we're gonna jump up on this post. Um, that's fine. Okay, there's a very small skip you can do here in jumping around this door, so you don't go through this cutscene. And is it gonna play out? Okay. You wanna know what we do to pretty little stowaways, or maybe you don't. She just got stuck on that. That's not supposed to happen, but hey, you know what? That's fine. Things kind of break when you do things unintentionally. Okay, jumping around that skips that small little cutscene, and you can bypass a little bit of the nonsense that happens through here. Nothing major. Either we are supposed to actually die doing that so we get a refresh on health and our ammo whenever you die and respawn you come back with a set amount of health and ammo per gun so we get some rockets and stuff but uh, we should be fine pretty much just use the shotgun for this fight anyways Grab another additional salt infusion. We need one more to max it out. One interesting thing about this fight, uh, which makes it very unlike any other fight in the game, is this turret up here actually counts as an enemy. Uh, the turrets don't count towards the enemy count for other fights. So we have to destroy this. Okay, that works. Give my stuff back. What just happened? You should use a rocket. Is my my friend's not up here? There's one more enemy. That guy that has a weapon called the volley gun. Very very important. I'm gonna be running the volley gun and the rocket launcher from now on. The volley gun is basically like a mini version of the rockets. It does self damage, but not as much. So we can consistently break our shield without taking a lot of actual damage. So it means we can. Activate our Hellrunner's hat boost more, can, uh, more often. Also, to get more ammo so we can kill more enemies. When we really want to death warp, the rocket comes in handy because it takes a big chunk of health away. But for everything else, the Hellrunner's hat is our new best friend. And this is, for the most part, the two weapons we'll have for the rest of the game. Right now and then, we'll swap to a different 
weapon temporarily. Hey, hey I'm slipping! Do not attempt to follow me, Mr. Twit. Elizabeth, I've made an arrangement to get our airship back. You can get us out of here. Yes. So, yeah, even though Elizabeth doesn't uh, really trust us anymore, and where will we get try to run away. Uh, team back up. A gunsmith in Finkton should be a walk in the park. What do you say, partners? You're a liar, Mr. DeWitt, and a thug. But you're also my only means of reaching Paris. Kind of stuck here in place for a second or two. It's really weird. Um, but we're going to come up here, and assuming we have enough money, which we absolutely should, we're going to get a damage boost for the rockets, the RPG, and then we're going to get a damage boost for the volley gun. I'm a little low on ammo. I'm going to come over here and just buy a little bit for both. Don't need a whole lot. That would be your gun speed. Yeah, so we're going to kill off two guards over here. Oh. There's some more enemies down below that we have to take care of. Oh, we're actually going to put down two Devil Kiss traps. For some enemies that spawn up top once we start this fight. Where did that shock jockey go? Did I actually kill him? No. Okay. Okay, so now we do want to death. Uh, because normally, we have to wait for this elevator to slowly rise up. But we need to make sure we don't die before she starts talking. So if she starts talking, that's great. Uh, okay. So there are iframes in this game once you get down to 1 HP. Uh, Bioshock 1 and 2 also have this mechanic. Or once you get down to 1 HP, you have iframes for a little bit of time. You can't die. Um... There. Now we're going to. Well, yeah, this elevator's up, so we're going to death warp through here again. We're going to be underneath it now. Get a Hellrunner's hat boost, jump around the corner, get out of bounds. Traverse through here and then load this part, which is after the very long quest line of going and getting the guns from the gunsmith. Right. We just skipped the entire quest line. We're now making our way to fight Daisy for the ship. Uh, and this gate is locked. Uh, and we don't have the means of actually unlocking it because of the skip that we did. So we're just going to death warp past it. Certain death warps that we do will take us to very specific spots. Uh, every now and then, like that one, the death warp will actually just respawn you where you died. So by jumping through the gate, uh, it's like, oh, you died on the other side. Let's resurrect you right here. And that means we can just run past everything. To another elevator where Elizabeth does her best sponge car impression. For a little bit. This is the brief moment to kind of reflect on the quest line that we just clearly did. He starts feeling guilty uh, from the things that happened. Which she's going to start talking about people that we've never met. Nor will ever meet. Um, and we'll be face to face with a Daisy. So the infinite loves its Exposition elevators. They're fantastic. May Lynn? Mr. Lynn? My God, I, I was so set on getting to Paris. I, I didn't really think that... You couldn't have known this would happen. I had a role in this catastrophe. If if you want to pretend that we're purely innocents in this, then that's your prerogative, but... Um, yeah, 
Yeah, so that quest line was supposed to really tell us about how Terra's work and timelines and actually traverse through like, the universes and whatnot. Um, so we, we were supposed to actually end up in a different timeline than what we were just in, but... Uh, Got around the whole shebang. That is by far the biggest skip currently in the game. Alright, take care of those two pesky guards. Undertow is a really useful vigor that we definitely want for the run, but uh, once again, if we pick it up here, we're going to get an animation that we don't really want to sit through. We're going to leave it be and we're going to actually buy it here in just a little bit. We have some stuff. So we're going to drop the RPG for this crank gun, which is like a little mini gun. Because uh, it is really useful. I put down some devil kiss traps up here for potential enemies spawning in. Now we just need to clear out all of these enemies. We're just going to use Bucking Bronco to melee this guy out into the void. And this is our first fight with one of the handymen that we saw earlier. Where Murder of Crows actually comes into play. We can use Murder of Crows to distract the handyman and shoot him in his weak spot. The crank gun. Everyone else off with the volley gun. There might be some enemies left up here. All right. The music is cleared up, meaning we've beaten the fight. Pick our RPG back up. No, no, no! She's going to kill that child. Booker, we have to do something. We have to act. We have to get in there. Come on, Booker. We've, we've got to get out of here. Boost me up. Go to the window and distract Daisy. Go! All right, while this plays out, we're actually going to run around and try to get some loot from these enemies. If left anything behind. And nothing crazy. Yeah, woo! Oh, there's raspberry jelly all over the floor. Oh no. Elizabeth. What a mess. Runs in the family. Oh well. Elizabeth. Whoa, whoa, hey, hey, easy. I'm gonna pick up our tenth and final salt infusion over here. And it makes Booker really not care about the situation at all. I feel better already. <laughs> just love the fact oh this uh deeply gruesome scene just played out, this traumatic experience for Elizabeth. But you know what, Booker? Feels better already. I, I think you should talk to me. <laughs> In that line. I, I feel like you should talk to me. This is kind of the turning point in the game. We've now passed the second big section. And Elizabeth has realized even more about herself. A little costume change, too. So, weird thing about this console is it is not centered at all. It's like tilted into the thing. I don't know why you would design it that way, but hey, you know what? How do you wash I'm not an engineer. You've done. You don't. You just learn to live with it. We got our airship. We can head back. Clearly, we're going to get away this time. Nothing could go wrong. I have no idea how these gears work, but they apparently set the coordinates and can make the thing go faster. 
Okay, and I'm not an engineer, but uh, these airships are making no sense at all. But hey, that takes us into the Emporia section of the game. A little bit more dark, brooding storytelling going on here. Blue Test Twins make a reappearance. Booker, we've got to stop them. No, that's the E. No, that is certainly it. No, it's not. It is. Isn't. Is. Isn't. Is. Stop it! Fine. Stop it! You don't Here know you what are. you're doing! Ha! Huh. There it is. No. You've done it now. He's... He's coming back. He's coming back. The notes were correct. The instrument was not. One needs both to get his attention. But if you know how to sing to him... He will take you where you need to go. Who are you? We are where we are needed. And needed where we are. So Comstock uses these songs. Are well, there others we can use? Something to keep the bird off our back? Perhaps you should ask the maestro himself. So where is he? <laughs> and they're gone. Of course. Well, at least they left Coming up here in just a second is one of the easiest skips um, to do. Like you can boot up the game and pretty much do it first try. Uh, if you're trying to learn how to do the run or just mess around with games, uh, to skip this upcoming fight, you just jump on this rail and then just jump over here. And you bypass the trigger that spawns in this fight. So, there you go. A little handy dandy skip. A little sugar rush over his hat boost right there. The fun thing you can do uh, with the lock picking is you, either you can death warp to get her to uh, like stop picking the lock and it'll just open automatically, or you can just run far enough away that her animation gets pulled to you. Because um, the game's always trying to keep her nearby. Uh, and that will open up. So now we're going to buy charge, undertow, and we're going to get the upgraded undertow, which is going to pull even more enemies towards us. And take the time to buy a little bit more ammo. Just got to do a little bit of fighting here. Until I grew up. This is just typically a pretty good spot for finding loot. Getting a lot of money. From this point on, we don't really need to buy any more upgrades. Uh, we kind of have everything we need. But we can get a couple more volley gun upgrades depending on how much money we have. We gotta wait for another gondola here for just a second. Check all of this stuff. Nothing crazy. Uh, so Undertow is an ability that will, when we hold it down, try to pull enemies towards us. We can group them up, uh, which makes big group fights very, very nice. So we can just hold this out, pull enemies, hit them with like a big AOE explosive. This one open. I'll see what I can do. Nothing there. Uh, and the other ability we bought, Charge, this one, um, does not have as many uses in the speedrun as it once did, but it lets you charge at an enemy. You can lock onto them and like fly across the map directly to them. Which we'll use for a very specific reason later. Giant balloons. Quantum particles suspended in space time at a fixed height. So. Well, we're not really going to see it because it's a speedrun. Uh, this is where you start kind of di uh, diving into who the Lutesses are and how they play a part in the story. And more about the actual tears going on. So we learned, like, what they do in the last area. <laughs> now we find out why they do what they do. Sort of. <laughs> This is the narrative part of like, how these were terrors are actually used for. It would be odder if we didn't. How do you suppose they manage that? I'll get back to you after I figure out the floating city bit. So no death warp out of this, but we will be setting one up here in just a brief second. We didn't actually run past a whole lot of enemies, but we need death warp at the same time. So you want to keep your health low, but not too low. Actually, use charge here in just a second. Get a little brief glimpse of it. So when you're in combat, you can't uh, have Elizabeth do pick locking. But for a brief second, when you death warp here, you're considered out of combat until the enemies catch up to you again. 
So, and have her pick that open, even though we didn't do this fight. Sometimes these enemies will spawn in a little bit early. Um, so if you're standing right in front of the gate, you're still considered in combat. That's why I stand off a little bit to the side, just in case. I'm going to brief in our mission before getting into downtown Emporia. The next like big hub story section of the game. If you've played it casually, this is where you typically deal with uh, Lady Comstock and her ghost. A very big hurdle for people playing on harder difficulties. As you may guess, we won't be seeing much of Lady Comstock. We're heading straight to Comstock's house. We'll get a nice little visit from Songbird. See someone mentioning in chat about the Buried at Seas DLCs. Uh, yes, there are speedruns for the Minerva's Den DLC for Bioshock 2 as well as Burial at Sea 1 and 2 for Infinite. Um, there's actually an extension to this category, the Bioshock Trilogy run, called the Bioshock Anthology run, which includes all three of those DLCs. Uh, it does not include the Protector Trials from 2 or Clash in the Clouds because they're not story DLCs and they're not really something that you want to speedrun. Um, but yes, people do run the individual DLCs and uh, there's a much larger category, which adds another hour and a half-ish um, onto this. So we see how freakishly large Booker's hands are or how freakishly small Elizabeth's hands are there. Not sure which. Maybe a little mixture of both. All right, quick trip through downtown Emporium. There's actually two really cool tricks here. One's going to get us past this opening fight sequence, and then the other is going to get us past everything else. Look, Fox was tearing this place apart. So we need to make our way towards this gate, which, um, because it is held by a pick lock, we're not supposed to be able to open it. Yeah, being in combat and whatnot. However, there is a little bit of a gap above the gate. You might notice. So if we can do some shenanigans, we can just fall over top of it. And now we see how much money I have. Uh, so I got a little bit of money. Unfortunately, it's a little hard to remember exactly where this stuff is in the menu. Okay, so we got the clip increase, that's fine. And we actually got both the clip and the damage increase. That's a crazy amount of money for this run. So, uh, typically you run up to the Comstock house here, or at least the gate. Uh, and it's like, oh, you have to go deal with Lady Comstock and her ghost and do these big fight sequences uh, and run around the map. And it takes a long time. Uh, but if we go back to the very beginning of the run with Parade Skip, we're going to bring back a familiar trick where we use a very high FPS to just slide into this wall. Clip out of bounds. Run over to this wall, slide in, real smooth-like. Now we're past the gate. <laughs> There's another very convoluted way to do death warps to get past that, but um, that's the more fun way. So a uh, crazy boost that we can do using Hellrunner's hat. Jump on this. The, there's a little bit of collision here. Nothing crazy. <laughs> Trying to activate a trigger way out here in the void. So yeah, not all of this has collision. You have to jump off this railing. Sooner than you'd think. I can actually... I'm a 
little bit further. Elizabeth's just so kind, giving us all the supplies. Okay. One of the trickier was to do, like Hill, uh, Hall of Heroes, Death Warp. Uh, pretty much have to like jump just right for this to work. Hey, there's Songbird. Okay, so jumping far enough triggers the map to go ahead and change. Usually a very long cutscene there where Elizabeth actually gets taken away from you. She's not supposed to be here with us. Songbird comes, is like, oh, I'm gonna kill you. And then Elizabeth says, you know what? I'll go with you if you let him live. So we get past all of that. It's definitely one of the, the harder skips to get consistently. Um, I wanna die so we get more health back, and get ammo. Um, this is where charge gets to shine. So by lining it up just right on the floor, we can target this turret way at the top of the house. Skip all the floors and just keep on running. A little Hell Runner's Hat sugar rush boosts. Uh, this is definitely supposed to be the dark, scary part of the game. The Boys of Silence. Keep using the volley gun to rock that uh, hill runner's hat shield break. Should be able to head downstairs and so we have to go rescue Elizabeth, even though we brought her in with us. She's right there. Oh, hey, look, we rescued her. You uh, bringing up the idea of this being the uh, scary part of the game reminds me when I played this game in college, that jump scare that happened like right there that you just like ran past. Uh, that's terrifying. You don't know that's coming. Oh yeah, that's definitely like the jump scare that gets people. <laughs> you thought for a moment this wasn't speedruns from the crypts, and you'd be wrong. There's a reason this is a scary game. We're gonna death warp to get off this elevator a little bit sooner. Uh, we can't actually run down here until blue tests pop up, otherwise the game soft locks. I want to be a little too fast. When the delicious question is when. Lives, lived, will live. Dies, died, will die. <gasps> As you can see, Booker, the lunatics are running the asylum. But so sometimes you lose Elizabeth between the elevator and here, yeah. Every now and then she's still around, and it's really funny to have both on screen at once. That's what I set into motion. Slides into its terminal stage. It took all I had left in me just to bring you here. Uh, Elizabeth, I, I don't understand. I heard you screaming. I was, I was coming to get you. Are we here? Take my hand. So Elizabeth has actually pulled us into the future where Comstock's uh, prophecy has come true. They've rained fire down on at New York. The seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. Say what you will about Comstock. He was a hell of a fortune teller. We got some time to kill here. Sometimes, uh, using FPS, you can the boost up on top. Stops. Don't you just hate it when you're having a casual conversation with somebody and they just keep trying to boost up on top of your head? It's too late for me. I brought you here for your sake. Yours and hers. Yeah. Ah, nah. I'll get the important note. What is this? This is the big, juicy details we need to beat Comstock. What does it say? It's advice. Advice on what? Not to me. All right, now that we've lost our Elizabeth, clearly she was just not with us before. Now uh, we have to go save her again. Elizabeth, I'm stuck. What are you doing to her? Let her be. Mr. Durant, 
One side effect of playing a uh, much higher frame rate than you're probably supposed to uh, is that you tend to get stuck on just any surface. So if you're like running to a tight area or running against a wall, a lot of times you just kind of get stuck to it. So if every now and then you see me kind of just like stop in place, it's because I've got to detach myself from the wall. Uh, once I pull this lever, I actually like can't die here. So even though I'm going to run past the enemies that can't kill me. I also don't want to go too fast here. Uh, if you try to go too fast, like outside of running, so I'm not doing like uh, shield breaks for Hillrunner's hat boost and stuff, you'll just clip straight through the floor and fall into the void, which is no fun. It is interesting for you to see the, the skybox, but for a speedrun setting, it's a no-go. So there is a, a chance we see some interesting things here. There are two interactions you're supposed to do with uh, Elizabeth's corset. One's like pulling it and the other one's like tightening it. Sometimes you can skip straight to the second one. No one's ever really found out how to do it consistently. It just happens sometimes. Um, and then sometimes when she goes to pick up her jacket, she will just despawn from the map for a good 40 seconds, which is just a flat time loss. Uh, we did some shenanigans back on the elevator by reloading the checkpoint before we death warped to help prevent that. But every now and then it still happens, so. Find an airship and we'll leave Harris, Elizabeth. Remember you wanted to go to We'll see what happens. We are going I look down at my Skyhook here. We'll see if she pops out of the map or not. So what, you're going to kill him? We'll be looking out on the left side of the screen whether her blue dress goes away. Know you. I'm not going to let you kill him. Really? Okay. Fucker. So she stayed in the map. That's great. Means we didn't just get free time loss. If she does happen to despawn, you just have to wait around for 40 seconds and then she pops back in. It's very strange, but you know. well, what are you going to do? We've also set up ourselves for a handy dandy little death warp on the next map. When did you learn that? Now we have Elizabeth back. And that brings us into like the final section of the game from like a narrative perspective. Uh, we're going to try to stop Comstock from enacting his prophecy. We have to make our way to the hand of the prophet, which is the big airship. So we need to get ourselves a ride and then get on over there. So we're going to start this little lockpick animation as soon as she starts. We're going to do a death warp. Just going to instantly unlock it. We can just run through. Skipping a whole bunch of dialogue there. Alright, now we get to kill some of the Patriots. We've kind of dealt with Patriots already. There's kind of bigger enemies than Nothing crazy. A little, a little bit beefier. So I'm killing very specific enemies in a very specific way. Um, oh, that guy actually survives. You want to kill the two Patriots and then kill off the uh, Volley Gunner? You can. But this air shot uh, spawns in faster. $123 in that one? Wow, that was crazy. Hand of the Prophet. <laughs> you run through this really fast. They just say Hand of the Prophet like five times in a row. Alright, so we got our airship uh, going on. A uh, brief moment of peace where we kind of get a little callback to the very opening of the game. Do you think it's possible to and then we have to do some fighting to 
keep our airship afloat. I don't see much use in that. Are you afraid of God? No. But I'm afraid of you. I don't know why they decide to just tie ribbons around these buildings, but man, it sure does look nice. Over there, it's Comstock's men. They're coming out to meet us. Seems like a, a big waste of time, but you know, aesthetically, it does look pretty nice. So we just need to kill off these enemies as soon as they spawn in. So that big ship right there is the Hand of the Prophet, making our way towards it. Just gonna knock this guy off the ship. Whoop. Every now and then the enemies like to hide. Uh, they can't actually jump to your ship, which is really annoying when you're trying to track them down, but luckily it's not too bad. Alright. Our next ship's actually already spawned in the map. It's way down there that we have to fight. It's kind of waiting for this one to get out of here. Fortunately, you can't really like just shoot rockets and stuff at it. Ah, oh, I missed. Okay. You don't really need to do that, but kind of helps out a little bit. Uh, you know, good ammo. Appreciate it. Okay. We deal with these three little machines, and then one more ship, and we're at the hand of the prophet. Not make it. It's fine. Okay. So we've done all the fighting, and now we are going to be setting up what is known as deck skip. Um, typically, you have to get on the hand of the prophet and traverse your way up it. And there's a part on the second floor where you're waiting for these pods to like drop off, so you can actually ride the zip line up. Must be where they're deployed from. Um, but okay. with really high That's FPS, pods are in place. we can actually yeah. just is at the top of the ship. Let's head avoid up. all that. So we're going to boost up here by jumping into that little box, which is already out of bounds. We're going to use high FPS to climb up this wall. When I say a high FPS, I mean like 350 is like the bare minimum to like even attempt to do this. Uh, we can grab the zip line spawned in up here and drop back down. Now let's just, just bypass the entirety of the Hand of the Prophet. One more deck. Let me take care of this on my own. No, I'm going with you. Now we need to run to Comstock's quarters. I actually do want to sort of set up for a death warp. It's not super important. I can set up for it. Uh, during the cutscene stuff happening. You've seen a run in the past. There was a really, really awful way to do um, Prophet Cabin skip where you would do a death warp um, while interacting with this door to like void out your collision to a certain degree. Um, but luckily we don't have to do that anymore so I can take this time Down the one HP. Siphon. I saw this there. I could hear you singing from above. And the machine came to life in response. And then in my mother's grave, there was a smaller one. They were draining me. And maybe that's why I can't. Can't what? When I was little, I used to be able not just to open tears, but I could create new ones to anywhere I wanted to go. But in the tower. Yes, I'll be right with you. Stand back. I'm ending this. Booker, no. This is between me 
and him. So unlike meeting with Andrew Ryan in Bioshock 1, uh, we can't really skip this part. Oh, come on, I don't bite. My, oh my, how you have grown. Tell me, what am I? Look at you, child, you're hey, a mess. Hey, let go of her. Elizabeth, everything I've done, I've done to keep you safe. Safe from what? Seed of the prophet shall sit the throne and drown in flame the mountains of man. But the archangel revealed something else. Beware, prophet. Beware the false shepherd, Booker DeWitt, for he shall be as a wall between her and destiny. Why? DeWitt, I'm a fool. I've set mighty armies to stop you. I've rained fire on you from above. I did all of that to keep you from her when all I needed was to tell her the truth. Now ask him, child. Ask him what happened to your finger. Ask DeWitt. <laughs> She's your daughter, you son of a bitch! And you abandoned her! Oh, was it worth it? Huh? Did you get what you wanted? Booker. Tell me! Booker! Tell me! It's... And Booker's not one for a nice casual conversation to discuss things out. Booker! You lock her up for her whole life! Booker! You cut off her finger and you put it on me! Booker, G stop it! Oh, that was an easy boss fight. What did he mean? Huh? You tell me, what did he mean? Okay, so as soon as we get our weapons back, we can skip a little bit of dialogue here with Elizabeth. I just assumed you were uh, so normally this is locked until they're done talking here. But uh, we once again death warp through this. What? Elizabeth, I swear to you, I have no idea what he was talking about. actually interact with this wheel on respawn getting us past the door into the next part so this is the final fight of the game uh no big bad boss battle unless you count comstock i mean so they get this really long convoluted wave fight oh uh, and then we have the outro of the game to go so still a little bit to play but the last combat section A-G-E. It's not a word, Booker. It's a song. Wow. So she finally deciphered the notes from old Elizabeth. Age is the notes for the song. Now Songbird is our friend. Whoa. What a cutie. So we're actually going to use Songbird in the fight to help us... Um, you can have him target one of the airboats or even the zeppelins. And he will go and destroy it and then go down on a cooldown. So we get to use him a couple times. Maybe a little sparing. Uh, so this is a fight where Undertow becomes really, really useful. Um, because a lot of enemies spawn in on these airboats or they're just hiding behind stuff. So by just grouping them all together. We can just take them out pretty easily. We're going to have Songbird take out that ship. Grab these guys off. You need salt. Booker, catch. Oh, I guess still alive. Booker, over there, the box. We need this thing to make it to Monument Island. Mm -hmm. Knock the Rocketeers off because they take too long to actually kill. So in this fight, if you don't hit the Rocketeers off just uh, just far enough, they will like land on the side of the big ship we're on and not die. It's pretty fantastic. Okay, so we've gotten to the first Zeppelin. Lay down some traps. Use 
new Songbird to take down the Zeppelin over here. Go for the Zeppelin. There's a Patriot. I badly missed that shot. Looking for two more Zeppelins to pop in. Here's another guy. Okay. Much obliged. I found ammo. Yeah, so there should be a Zeppelin on the left, a Zeppelin on the right. So we're going to use Songbird to take out one, but he's actually on a cooldown. It's the icon on the, the right side of the screen, the little Songbird icon with the timer. Uh, but, well, he's going to be taking care of one. We're actually going to jump on this other one. It's actually surprisingly a mechanic that not a, people, not a lot of people were aware of. You can actually get on the Zeppelins and just take them out yourself. So Songbird is just going to be coming off cooldown here in just a second. And while he takes out this Zeppelin for us, we're going to go clear out the main deck once again. Sometimes this is a little... A little glitchy. There. Okay. So yeah, now we just need to take out... These enemies. Sometimes we'll get another additional wave depending on how long uh, the Zeppelin takes to fade out. We might also see some more Rocketeers pop up on either side. So we're just going to check here. end here in a moment. Takes a second to update. Yeah, okay. So once this one's join Elizabeth at the bow. Can uh, head over here. That's the final fight. All we have to do is the outro. Hooray. Which, while if you play this casually, it's a lot of just walking through, kind of unraveling the mysteries of the story. Uh, we'll only can celebrate with some fireworks real quick. And that's what you want. It's the only way we'll find the truth. Uh, there's a little bit of speed tech that we get to apply throughout here. Tear it down. Tear it all down. So this is where the story, while it's already kind of dipped into the whole multi-universe theory, uh, really takes it to the extreme. Longbird takes out the tower, which gives Elizabeth her full power to uh, kind of do whatever she wants. This is where it's kind of fun to do all these games back to back to back. Things kind of start to tie together. If you're here about three hours ago, this room may look familiar. The game eventually dragged us back to Electrobolt cutscene. Unfortunately, Songbird cannot stay with us as cool as the character as he is. It's all right. I'm here. Just let go. I'll get some F's in chat for the best boy, the best burb. Elizabeth. He will now be bared at sea. Yeah, it looks a little bit better than the last time we were here. Elizabeth. It's adorable. Nice carpet, everything. One of many. This way. What do you mean it's a doorway? Where are you going? Oh, come on. Yes, it's this way. Comstock said. We got a, a brief little tease of Rapture in this game. Here? Uh, here. But it's really the Barrel C DLCs 1 and 2 that this really tie uh, Columbian Rapture together. There's notes here and there, and 
brief this. crossover throughout the game. Uh, stuff that we skipped over, but if you really want to see how the two connect, definitely check out the barrel at seas. <gasps> City at the bottom of the ocean. I, uh, Ridiculous. I definitely want to say my favorite fun fact about the Bioshock series is that the uh, the main character in the first game is four. Yeah, he's a super mutant baby. <laughs> it just you don't think it when you see it, but yeah, he's he's four. Yeah, it's a fun fact that like it's it's very easy to forget. Uh, he's like genetically modified to grow up. Look at that. It's also like at the end of like Bioshock One, he dies so quickly. Like the the little sisters age up a bit, but it goes from like I don't know, early thirties to being dead in like five years. So we're back at the lighthouses. Lighthouses are actually doors into different worlds. I'm always a lighthouse. I'm always a man. Come on. There's a little bit of fun stuff we get to do here, but a lot of exposition. Beautiful view. Are you going to open it? Oh, it's no good. Damn it. I thought once we were here, I, I could fully control it. I, I thought. What is that? Whoa, it's a key. From. That key definitely fits that lock. I just, I just couldn't see it. Well, that that did the trick. All right, so we're not going to like fully clip through uh, this wall, but we're going to clip into it just enough to where it gives us a slight boost. That's going to put it put us on top of the invisible wall, past this little barrier. Uh, and you might remember a gear I picked up back in the Blue Ribbon alongside Sugar Rushed called Fleet Feet, which allows us to have faster movement walking back and side to side. Uh, in this whole area, because it's supposed to be explaining stuff, they slow you down walking forward. But Fleet Feet actually exactly. makes it so if we walk backwards or at an angle uh, to go faster. So right here I'm going to be traversing in a very awkward manner. Why? There's a very small skip you can do here. Um, but you go over top the void, and if you mess it up, you have to go pretty far back in the outro. So we're just not going to do that today. Very, like, very, very small time save. It's cool, though. All right. Waiting for this to pop up. And we're going to be walking backwards. Okay. There's actually two lighthouses you can go into up here. It doesn't matter which one you go into. We're going to actually try to go into both. They both lead to the same spot. Um, let's see if we can get up. Okay. So if you hold back and jump as you enter there, uh, you unload it, pop back out here. We can run over to the other one real quick, backwards, by the way. Uh, and all, of, all this does is it skips a very small time that you have to wait to start the uh, bit of dialogue here. We run up, we can just accept the baptism right away. For whatever reason, doing the skip lets you start that instantly. Double up the dialogue. Instead of waiting like 30 seconds. No, I don't want to. Yes. Jesus! Wash this man clean. Wait. Father, make him Stop born it. again. Lord. Stop it. What no. are you doing? Do it. Get off me! Get off! Son. You didn't go through with it. You that. think a dunk in the river is going to change the things I've done? Let's get out of here. Hey, look, these doors of yours, they're, they're all tears, right? We'll open one up. Open one up to Paris. I want to be shut of all this. Not until we find Comstock. Comstock's dead! No. <laughs> he was here. This way. Another flashback into the room. There's a lot of crazy stuff going on, but I just want to pay attention to this doorknob real quick. Like, look at how crazy high quality that doorknob is. Yes. It's like RTX 4K Ultra HD. That thing is looking real nice. Like this low quality baby over here. And then this bad boy. All the dev time went right here. It's crazy. 
there was no baby, and if there was, I sure as hell wouldn't give it over to this guy. Booker. So pay attention that this doorknob's on the left side of the door. Very important, by the way. Don't forget it. Bring us the Be on the quiz later. And wipe away the debt. <laughs> so if you have no idea what's going on in the story, don't worry. Uh, this baby is Elizabeth. Eventually you'll give him what he wants. She's actually our child that we've given away. behind all the doors. And behind one of them, I see him. Comstock. What choice do I have? Can I give a baby the lettuce? The debt's paid. Mr. Comstock washes you. There's a lot of very uh There's a lot of details behind the story that we've <laughs> just skipped over in this, but uh Basically, Comstock and Lady Comstock, Elizabeth's mother, in their timeline could not have a child, so they used the Lutest twins, who discovered the whole universe hopping stuff, uh, to find this booker who willingly gives up his daughter that he had to pay off his gambling debts. And then he feels bad about it, and... Uh, oh, well, we'll let the rest play out. It's gonna walk him backwards because it is just faster at the moment than walking forward. It's not over because the prophet is dead. It will only be over when he never even lived in the first place. Hey, hey, the deal is off. You hear me? Unstable. The deal is off. Give her back. Give her back. Fine. Are you mad? Give her back, you son of a bitch. It's ready. Go. No. 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 Machine. No! Shut it Anna. down! Shut down Anna. the machine! Now do it! Give me back my daughter! <laughs> no! So that's what happened to her pinky. And that is why she has the ability to control tears. Because she exists in different dimensions. Or different universes. Uh, yeah, this doorknob is magically up to the right side of the door. Proving we're in a different universe. With your regret for almost and definitely not just a random thing. Until one day, a man came Still looking super classy. Okay. I actually have to be really careful not to stand near this wall. Otherwise, it's very possible to soft lock here. Okay. So I have one little boat ride. One little boat ride, and then we run to the end, and we're done. You suppose he branded himself as some sort of penance? Hmm, sure. I don't see the point. What's done is done. What's done will be done. Hmm. I suppose the brand is his hair shirt, as he is ours. Kind of putting the final pieces together. <laughs> and as we come to a close, um, I do want to say thank you guys for having me on the show. It's always a blast to show off these games. I will be running Bioshock 2 alongside Amnesia Rebirth at Summer Games on Quick coming up at the end of May. Uh, so if you like these runs, there'll be another another one to look forward to. Uh, but I also do a lot of these on my own channel, along with the many other games, a lot of the other Amnesias, Dishonored, Wolfenstein, Doom, Outlast, just a whole bunch of games uh, from time to time. You know, but according to the timer that I'm running on my own end, uh, I believe this will be a trilogy record. I, I beat it last night with all the new stuff by about 10 minutes, and this seemingly will beat it by another minute and a half. So, well, if you're wondering how fast someone's ever done these games back to back to back, you were literally here. So, say hi to YouTube. Dude, uh, congratulations for one and uh, for two. Uh, funny enough, I think last time you were uh, on the, uh, the crypt, uh, you actually ended up doing Amnesia Rebirth. Yes, we did uh, the Frictional Amnesia games. Trilogy. Uh, hmm. Walking back, and that is our final time. That is indeed the trilogy record by about a minute and a half. All right, GG. It's also the end for Booker DeWitt. You can have the uh, the ending play out here, but I want to say a really quick thank you once again for doing the run for us. This isn't the same place. Yeah. <laughs> you know, coming in a, a little underestimate on that one. You know, all the new stuff has made all of the runs much faster than when I've done these previously. 
Uh, but yeah, if you're still trying to pay it along with the story, um, Comstock and Booker are the same person. They just split at uh, the point of baptism way back in the day. The ones that accepted the baptism became Comstock, and the ones that didn't became Booker DeWitt. So to put everything back in order, one last deed must happen. So Booker is now taken out of the timelines. You can see the respective Elizabeths, Elizabeths, pass away. So that's been the Bioshock trilogy. You know, maybe one day it'll become a quadrilogy with uh, another release. But uh, yeah, once again, thank you guys for having me. If you do like any of these runs or have questions about them, you can uh, DM me on Twitter, Discord, hop in my channel when I'm streaming. Stream typically every night, 8 p.m. Eastern onward. Uh, a Tuesday through Sunday, so and find me there. And yeah, always a great time on speedruns from the crypt, running the spooky games. Yeah. Uh, once again, I do want to say thank you, and uh, as well, if you have not checked them out, uh, you can find Blood Thunder over at a variety of places online: twitch.tv slash Blood Thunder. I'm pretty sure YouTube, Twitter, all that uh, should be all the same name. You can find a lot of the uh, both. The, the horror FPS and the, I guess, general FPS as well. And, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I do want to say thank you once again for doing the run, and thank you, Twitch chat, for being here. Thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Speedruns from the Crypt. Uh, we will be back in about two weeks. Uh, we always have the horror content here for you. Uh, I'm your host, Dick Dysis. I do plan a lot of these shows. If you ever are curious, you can just, I don't know, Find me in a whole bunch of areas under that name. Uh, I do want to say thank you once again all for being here and hope you have a wonderful rest of the day and or night. Uh, as well, tomorrow we'll be having the, the first step, uh, which will be Keys and Hobbs tackling some new game at 7 p.m. EST. All right, everyone. Have a good rest of the day or night and see you next time.